Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And welcome to night number two of this week on Spaced Out Radio. As we get into Bigfoot, Sasquatch, one of my favorite researchers, Thomas Seawood, is here tonight to break down the legendary creature, Sasquatch Island, and how to search for the big guy. Yeah, we're in for a lot of fun with Thomas tonight. I know you're going to love him, and you guys are all here too, which makes the night that much more special. We're talking race fan in the gold medal position, and B with a silver, Laura Lobbs, taking in the bronze medal tonight. Hi, Robert Lamoth and Jimmy Gonzalez. Jimmy Gonzalez will be signing autographs after the show. Light up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. We have Jessica S. Lulu Bell, how are you? Luffy Pirate, Brown Dwarf, and um, let's see, Karen in the Woo Train. Thank you for coming on in. Road Flare, Stephanie Kenny Blankenship, Roy Boy, nice to see you all. My man, the preacher. I love the preacher. The preacher will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio, if you don't mind, to the right of the studio. Continuing on, D. Cohen, Deer Slayer, Griff, Super Knower, Jennifer Patterson. Nice to see you all. D. Wayne Wise, the former Toronto Blue Jay, right there. Uh, the unknown, what's happening, my man? Super Knower, how you doing again? Nick Adkins and Roger Murray. Thank you for coming on in. Here we go with Mr. Cowley. Welcome back to the show. Oh, Mr. Cowley loves his spaced out radio. Continuing on, Susie B. Thank you for joining us. Vanessa, W. David Page, Kevin, Mary R., the lovely Amy W.C. Did anybody just see an orb kind of go like right here on my, that was weird. Maybe, maybe I saw something different, but I don't know. Anyways. Moving on, who else do we have? Les Paul Holland, thank you for joining us as we continue on with Roll Call tonight. Dino Bravo, Millennium, my man. Thank you for coming on in. Tim Mothman and his beautiful goatee. Good to see you. D. Saifa, thanks for coming on in. Kurt M. is back. Kurt M. will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio, if you don't mind, to the right of the studio. Continuing on with our Roll Call, we have up next... Let's see here. Steven Edmund. Good to see you. Terrible times. Thanks for joining us. Mike, what's happening? Rat Sass. How you doing, buddy? And number 14 in your program, starting at left wing from Stockholm, Sweden, Lars Janssen. There he is. All right. Continuing on. And we have Abbott Hoffman. Welcome to SOR chat. And uh, Pixie Lara. What do you think here, Pixie Lara? I look kind of dapper with this on, don't I? Well, considering you made it, I, I I told you how much I love this hat, by the way. Ukrainian Anita, how you doing? Welsh Hammer, Doug Shelby is here. The Doug Shelby has arrived, which means we can officially start this show. Lead the B, what's happening, my man? Justin Hemmingson, thanks for coming on in. Hello, Susan Alloway, good to see you. And who else do we have? Monica and Nina Williams, nice to have you here. And we are caught up so far. Let's get the radio sides started here welcome to the radio and podcast side of spaced out radio tonight my name is dave scott we're going to be talking bigfoot with thomas seawood tonight we're going to get the show going momentarily as we are on roll call for our audience on youtube and on spreaker 
which means we are waiting diligently for Bill WD-40 to enter the chat room and lube us up for tonight's show because you always want to go into a show nice and smooth. Scan man, how you doing? Paul Damon, what's going on? There's Bill WD-40 currently lubing up as we speak. Yeah. Hey, I want to remind you, the Super Chat is open. It's a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you so much for everything that you do as an audience. We very much appreciate it. And what else can I tell you here? All right. Our store is open on our website, spacedoutradio.com. We do not have ugly swag, people. Nothing ugly about our swag. So make sure you go in there, you do a little shopping. And, uh, you know, with Christmas coming up and by the way, I do encourage all brawling as black Friday is away. Hey, you might shop online, but you know what? You're going to have to beat some people up to get our t-shirts. Okay. Do it right. America. Let's get this thing going. Cecil, how you doing? My man, long time, no time horns up. Let's rock. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk, Talk Stream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at spaced out radio, Instagram at spaced out radio show, and you can join us on Patreon in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. We got a great show of entertainment and value tonight. We get into the Bigfoot world. Thomas Seawood is here from his beautiful home in Washington State to talk about the big hairy beast. Then, in hour number three, Steve Stockton will be here for another great story on Among the Missing. Following up that, we will have Super Duke with the Cryptid Report. Thomas Seawood is a First Nations member in Canada who was born in Alert Bay off the northeastern Vancouver Island in 1965. He became interested in his people's art as a boy, watching the great carvers that are no longer with us creating. His father took him to the carving sheds to work, and Thomas would play or sleep in the cedar chips upon the floors. Some may know Thomas from his television series Aboriginal Adventures or the many appearances he makes on Sasquatch and Bigfoot television shows, movies, podcasts, and conferences sharing the stories and beliefs of the, of the creature, this being the Sasquatch that people know all about. And you know what? It's been a long time, about a year or so, since I had Thomas on this show. And I love it when he is on because there is no one more interesting to talk to about this than Thomas. How you doing, my friend? It's always good to have you back on Spaced Out Radio. Doing good. Thanks for having me back on. Absolutely, my friend. What have you been up to? How has your 2023 been in search of the Sasquatch? Been busy, very busy. I'm finally able to be home here for a bit working on my art. You can see all the art. Behind me here, I'm working on that bowl right now of uh, Tonakwa, our Sasquatch to the Kwakwakiwak people. And I'm getting commissions for people wanting more Sasquatch art than anything else. So staying busy and then also getting ready for 2024, all the conferences that they're, we're getting booked for. We just finished in September the first ever Alaska Bigfoot cruise with Gather Up Events. We went from Seattle to Ketchikan, Alaska, Juneau. Huna, which is Icy Strait Point, and then back down to Seattle, and there was uh, 200 cabins sold out with almost 400 people, and we had a blast on there, and I just would have had to go to AA when I got back after eight days of having drinks. 
<laughs> See, I would be in trouble at, at something like that. I really would because as a non-drinker, I would probably uh, break my uh, my sobriety from that. But that's okay. That's what the fun about Sasquatch is all about. Thomas, you are somebody who is extremely well known on this subject. You you're more of a flesh and blood person than a woo type of of person when it comes to this creature. You've grown up around it. You've had multiple encounters with this. Your heritage has stories going back generation upon generation about interactions with Sasquatch. How special is this creature to you? Well, to me, after seeing him quite a few times and, you know, being as close as I am to you, you know, five, six feet away and looking at their facial features and just seeing how they act and everything. I've, I, I at one time with Dr. John Binderdagel on Vancouver Island in the early nineties, when I met him, him and I both believe they were uh, on the branch of Gigantopithecus blackie. And, uh, it was just before John passed that I went to him and I'm like, John, I don't think it's Gigantopithecus blackie. I think they're humans. He go, I said, then he goes, why? You know, he's a scientist. So he's like, why do you think they're human stuff? So I gave him all of my, you know, observations and doing the investigating and uh, interviewing people about their Sasquatches in the Pacific Northwest, Canada and the US and Alaska. You know, I just said, to me, I think they're the perfect human. We all know as humans, if we believe in evolution, that our ancestors jumped out of a tree and they were quadruped. And eventually they quit dragging their knuckles and they stood up and they became bipedal and they would lose their body hair and their pronounced ridges on their brows. And they would become to what we are now, the hairless bipedal species of North America. Well, I think during that evolutionary path, I think the Sasquatch, what we call Sasquatches now, we were with them. And that's why I always say um, uh, Sasquatch is not part human. We are part Sasquatch because during that evolutionary path, I believe that some of those early humans said, look, we're starting to use tools. We're using fire. Uh, we have uh, social structure. We now have, if we reflect to the gods must be crazy from the 1980s, how a empty Coca-Cola bottle disrupted a bush tribe in South Africa to the point where they had envy, greed, fighting, violence when that girl bonked the other girl on the head with the empty Coke bottle because she wanted it. And the father, the clan leader, had to take that bottle to the edge of the world and throw it back to the gods because they must have been crazy to give them that pool, that materialistic piece of property that disrupted his clan. And I think some of our earlier ancestors said, this is BS. We can't be using fire. We shouldn't be napping rocks into arrowheads knives and spearheads because now we have all of this negativity that comes with it the greed the materialist materialism the infighting the warfare look what tool you know weapons got us we have putin biden and rocket man with their fingers above buttons ready to eradicate us with nuclear bombs because we started to use fire back in our evolutionary path Whereas Sasquatch, from what I learned from the Omaha Indian tribe when I was down there twice, and Lucas White, who's a good friend of mine on the tribe, he taught me that they have laws, very strict laws. They don't use tools. They don't use weapons. They don't have inter clan fights. And, you know, we do know they have rendezvous where they vocalize and gesture to one another and converge into what we would have a rendezvous for the mountain men back in the day and trappers. But the Indians in North America had powwow and potlatch. They had those yearly gatherings so that they could strengthen the species by spreading the seed. You know, you can't have intermarriage, you know, breeding within the clan because, of you know, we know what incest brings. But when we look at the Sasquatches, to me, I just think they evolved to be bigger because the humans now had fire and weapons and mass and they were the bipedal creature during the day that were in conflict with the Sasquatches, killing them because my tribe used to have strict laws where if someone went into your berry patch, fish harvesting area, clam digging shellfish zone, you could kill those thieves without any retaliation to your family or person who killed those thieves. 
So if my tribe was like that pre-contact and just afterwards for a limited time, just think about Sasquatches back in the old days when they have to compete with the hairless bipedal tribes people of North America, and we have weapons and fire and mass. Well, the Sasquatches would evolve further to become the bipedal creatures of the night, which I call them the humans of the night, because we know they have nocturnal vision, their eyes reflect light, and they're mostly active at nighttime because they don't want to interact with us. They can't compete with us, especially now. We have guns and metal knives and so forth. So that's what my perspective of a Sasquatch is. They're the perfect human. They're just bigger, hairier, smell stronger, and have nocturnal vision. So for you growing up with this around you, these creatures around you, you've lived in cabins where they you've been surrounded. You, you've grown up in areas that are very desolate, I mean, for you on a personal level, what does this creature mean to you? Um, scares the hell out of me when I get close to them. I'll tell you that even to this day after decades in bush. But to me, they <laughs> I think about the Indian in the 1970s in a TV commercial in buckskin in a birch bark canoe paddles into the urban environment and sees the pollution, the smog, the gridlock traffic jam, the factories, the streams and rivers that were destroyed by our pollution and at the end of the commercial that car goes by him and a guy throws a bag of fast food garbage at his feet and the end of the commercial is the buckskin indian with a tear coming down his eye it would start the green movement environmentalism it would kick start greenpeace and other environmental organizations and that, to me, that Indian and buckskin is why we need to have conclusive proof of the existence of Sasquatch. Because we as a species, the hairless bipedals, will hopefully finally smarten up and realize that we're sharing our North America Sasquatch Island with another bipedal creatures. And if it is, as the DNA is starting to lean towards just human, then we're going to have the third indigenous tribe of the United States and the fourth indigenous recognized tribe of Canada. And we already know what us Indians and Inuit cost the governments of Canada and the U.S. billions of dollars each year. And the Indians are getting so powerful in British Columbia that they're shutting down trophy bear hunting and wolf hunting and other hunting. They're stopping pipelines and uh, other industry. They're, you know, some tribes are adamantly against logging and they're curtailing that. Can you imagine when Sasquatch is finally identified? The Indians are going to step up with the environmental non-government organizations, environmentalists. And we're going to see what we saw with the marbled murelet and the spotted owl in the early 90s, where hundreds of millions of hectares of lands were taken off the resource extraction development process. And with Sasquatch, we're going to see, you know, people are going to be told, even on your private property, because it's possibly Sasquatch habitat, you're not going to be able to remove those trees without an environmental process and the impact studies and permitting. And, you know, you're going to have uh, industry shut down from logging and mining and pipeline development and urban sprawl development. And so to me, we need that. Because the present path that we hairless bipedals are going on, we're doomed to destruction of our species. You know, we'll defecate where we grow and harvest our food. We'll even grow our prawns and shrimp in human feces and animal feces. And that's why I don't eat any shrimp or prawn that says farmed in the grocery stores. And I prefer wild if I can get it, but, you know, uh, myself harvesting. But, you know, if I can buy it, I make sure it's wild harvest because that... Uh, farmed industrial what they pawn off as shrimp is this garbage and you know this is what we need we need the smack upside the head so to speak to be get with the program and start seeing that maybe we should start mass developing our solar projects and our wind farms and looking at the petroleum industry to get away from fossil fuels and you know start developing hydrogen more for our vehicles and other things you know we're on that path but we're dragging our butts about it and we need a reality check and that's where i see the conclusive proof of sasquatch is really gonna wake us up and get us on the right path with so many people who have been seeing sasquatch over the decades 
it doesn't matter. We're just focusing on North America right now. We know that there are creatures like it around the world. We got the Yaoi, the Yeti, just to name a couple. Yeah. Okay. But focusing on North America with this, why do you think we are still looking for this creature? Why are we having so much trouble to prove its ex its existence? Because we're the dumbest critter on the planet. And most of those bumbling, stumbling people, especially when someone says, I'm a Sasquatch researcher, right away I go, egomaniac, you're not a researcher until you get a Diane Fossey Jane Goodall interaction with the clan or a Sasquatch. Until then, you're an egomaniac because you're not a researcher. We call ourselves stumbling, bumbling investigators like me. And we're speculating on Sasquatch because we don't have that interaction. Even though I've come close and one of my team members is getting has been really close and hopefully we can get that interaction going. But most humans, they don't do the number one thing like Lewis and Clark did. When Lewis and Clark wanted to find the Skookum Chuck, the big salt water on the other side of this big massive landmass that we call North America, I call Sasquatch Island, be smarter, charter an Indian guide. He went and hired Indian guides, Sacagawea being one of them. And we can look at every other explorer who found British Columbia's uh, heads of inlets and gold fields and the list goes on. They hired Indians. So most of the investigators I see, and that's why I'm an investigator, and I guess you could say a, a Sasquatch celebrity where I'm on TV and I'm at conferences and so forth. I'm getting the message out. If you want to find Sasquatch, look in your backyards into the traditional territories and the tribe that lives as your neighbor and has lived there for thousands of years and go meet them, introduce yourself, ask them protocol and permission to investigate the Sasquatches in their traditional territories, your backyard, and then ask them, how do you say, hello, I don't know who you are. I come in peace in your language. So that when you do get permission from the Indians and you go out, you now have their perspectives and beliefs and encounters and seasonal migrations where you should go to find your Sasquatch. And then in turn, when like you had one close to you, you're able to say, yo, Hello, I don't know who you are, Sasquatch. What are you up to, Sasquatch? And like me, you might hear back, and they move off. He said, I'm fine, and mumbled something else I didn't understand, but he knew I came in peace and I wasn't a threat, and he just moved away. You know, that's happened three or four times with me out in my bush life. And this is what, you know, I think every investigator, Sasquatch enthusiast needs to do. Go meet your local Indian tribe. And in turn, you're going to find all these doors opening up to you to make it so that when you do go out and do what I call bush chess, that's playing chess with a Sasquatch, you're going to have to learn things. And that's one of the reasons why I do Sasquatch investigations. I do training programs with people in Washington State and Vancouver Island and elsewhere. I'll even fly to your state or your province and teach you how to play bush chess, how to get close to a Sasquatch and where to find them at seasonal times of the year. Are they migratory? Absolutely. Seasonal migratory within their clan territory. Okay. So what would be their range? Like, for instance, you know where I live in the Caribou of British Columbia. Okay. To the west, we have the Fraser River, which is very dangerous to cross. To the east, we have, it, it goes right to the Rockies. And if you go north, it goes to the Arctic. If you go south, well, we're a few hours from the from the border in Washington state. So, I mean, would they be heading to warmer climate or are they following the, the, the food path like deer and rabbit? What, what do they do? It's all about abundant seasonal protein and within a defined area and on Vancouver Island and the mainland, just North and East of Vancouver Island, North part, I have found in my, well, I can call it research there because I'm researching the Indians because my Indian tribes of the Kwaklaqiwak Nation, we have 16 recognized tribal groups that have their defined territories, some overlap, but you'll find that geological prominent features, a point, a river, a island, mountains, that defines a boundary. 
And when I started to correlate my tribal boundaries and seasonal migration for wintertime shellfish, springtime herring spawn areas, and uh, late mid-spring oolagin smelt at the head of the glacier melt rivers, and then your big tides of May and June during the daytime exposing shellfish like scallops, rock scallops, abalone, sea urchins, and other things because they're big tides during daylight and seaweeds that are just starting to grow, which are all edible. And then you have your salmon coming in and or your berries come in and then your fawn drops, which are in June on Vancouver Island where the Sasquatches are migrating up into the alpines where the fawn drops are taking place with the ungulates, the elk and the deer and the mountain goat. And then when they look down in August and July, they look down and see the forest fires and all the stupid hairless humans having their homes and their communities burned by forest fires because we live in the forest or edge of it. Well, the Sasquatch is above the forest, the alpine, and they just watch the forest fires sweep by them. And if they're getting smoked out up in the alpine, they just go down and up the other mountain and watch the forest fire go and smoke go past them. But when they do look down in Vancouver Island area and, uh, beginning of August and they see the backs of eagles and they see white dots of seagulls flying in the creeks and streams. The salmon have returned. The Sasquatches migrate down for the salmon this time of the year at the end of October, mid-November when the monsoon season starts as it is now and the rivers blow out. The salmon spawn ends. The rivers are too deep and flooded for Sasquatch to harvest anyway. They migrate, swim if they have to, to the shellfish beaches. So when I looked at that and I did correlated it to the Sasquatch reports going back 30, 40 years and finding out that, wow, the cinnamon Sasquatches seem to stay in this area, which is, encompasses this Kwakwakiwak tribal territory. And then the one-eyed Sasquatch that got shot by a person 15 years ago, he seems to be in this area, which correlates to this Indian tribe on Vancouver Island. So it's almost like the tribal territories of the Indians correlate and overlap to the clan territories of the Sasquatches through the reports of what Sasquatches were seen at given times during those different abundant seasonal protein sources that are, you know, found in heavy abundance, like uh, herring spawns. You know, the herring spawns are generally in given areas but you know you can walk into the water ankle deep and bend down and pick up five gallon bucket of herring in 15 minutes or less so can you imagine being a sasquatch they know where these seasonal migrations are but then we have the reports of sasquatches going over mountaintops and even being videoed in the squamish area twice mission once in british columbia and what i see is that individual seems big males traverse and snow caps to go into another region. That's the nature's code. We always have to have that genetic strengthening of a species by spreading our seed. So it's just uh, maybe a younger male that got kicked out of his clan or a big dominant male that got ousted by a younger male. Well, is he going to stick around? It's like getting kicked out by your ex-wife. You're going to stick around your ex-wife? No, mine's, I call her my ex-monster. I don't want to be with her evilness, you know? So I moved, migrated away from her like Sasquatches do when they get toppled as a clan leader. But then that opens up another quandary of what is a rogue? Well, a rogue is a Sasquatch that's gone postal. It got ousted as a clan family leader by a younger male because that's nature's code. But it went postal. Something snapped upstairs. And I snapped when I got kicked out in 20, 2008 from my mother and my children. And I wanted to do some nasty things. And I went to the bush and lived like a Sasquatch for a long time. And I did that back in the early 1990s for months living in the bush because I snapped because of a girlfriend who did something to me that and right. uh, other things. So I know what the Sasquatch is like. So rogues, when I hear about them, to me, they're Sasquatches that were displaced, but they got bigger, more aggressive, and they're lone, lone survivors, so to speak. Thomas, we're going to take a break here on Spaced Out Radio, learning more about the Sasquatch tonight from the legendary researcher, Thomas Seawood. 
We will be right back with more on the legendary Bigfoot right here on Spaced Out Radio. We'll be right back. All right, we are clear. You called me a researcher. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. <laughs> hey, you know, you know my definition of how to tell if a if a researcher is bullshit or not? Oh. If they use the word squatch. I totally agree with you. <laughs> yeah, if if you're going squatching, you have nothing to do with Bigfoot research or trying to do anything. Just before I forget, what's your email? Dave at spacedoutradio.com. Okay. Hi, Thurston Howell the third. The old man on Benny Hill was the best, especially when Benny Hill would top uh, pat his top of the of his head. Love yeah. that. Love that. Oh. Let's see your hat. Well, this way. Sasqu oh, Sasquatch Island. Yeah. Nice. That's my shirt. Whoop, whoop. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, I better send you some scrog. Love it. Love it, man. So. Can Sasquatch the Legend.com sponsor one of your shows or something? We can figure something out. Yeah. We we can figure something out. We're just uh, getting that part figured out. Give me a couple weeks on that. So how many Big listeners do you got? Um fluctuates between our nighttime listeners on our radio side and then our YouTube side and our podcast side, thousands, tens of thousands. Maybe over a hundred thousand or more. Cool. Don't forget to send me a link for this one. And I'll post it on Sasquatch Island. Yeah, for sure, buddy. For sure. Uh, uh, Vanessa, we're not going to play that card here, okay? If you're just going to stir it up and play cards because of somebody else's opinion, we don't do that here. I'm done with drama in the chat room. Okay. And no, my channel hasn't gone downhill, Vanessa. So you can either erase that comment or I will erase it for you. All right. No, not not that not your Vanessa one. We're talking about Van, Vanessa two right now. Okay, I think uh, she's on Grandma's perfume right now. So <laughs> no, nobody's playing that shit in my in my chat room. I'm done with the drama in the chat room, and uh, um, there's going to be some new rules coming up. You got to remember, people, especially if you're new. My chat room isn't a democracy. Okay, it's a Daveocracy. Okay. Uh, or or Dave Unism, whatever you want to call it. Okay. The uh, I don't care, Vanessa. You know what, Vanessa? You go have a, a lonely drink. We're gonna give you a five minute major for mouthing off. Okay. <laughs> so you're you're done for five minutes, and uh, if you smarten up or or whatever, then you can you can come back and and uh, you know be nice, but. My rules. I, I I don't understand where you think that you can say what you want in my chat room. Hi Sandra. Hi Sandra. Hi Sandra. All right. No, that's ending too, there, Ross Dog. Okay. No more. There's going to be no more drama in my chat room. I'm tired of it, especially after last night tired of it it's dead to me okay trying to have a good show and a good night 
and, and two good shows and two nights, and I got to worry about chat room bullshit. Vashti Impaler, how you doing? And uh, JBD, how you doing, man? Thank you, Paul Damon. My beard feels great right now. Feels fantastic. Preacher, I'll be giving you a call tomorrow. I Lost Souls Trilogy, how you doing? Stu Gerson, Duck Fan, how you doing? 22 seconds, Super Chat is open. It's a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. You can shop at our store and our website, spacedoutradio.com, and join the Space Travelers Club for as low as 5 bucks a month here. And, uh, yeah, here we go with the second half hour, everybody. Hold on, Tom. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears. Reminder to all of you, if you want to enjoy this show more often or catch more of it, you can check out our free archives on YouTube or on any major podcast network like Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, iTunes. Yeah, we're all right there. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and you can join us on Patreon in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Here we go. Thomas Seawood hanging out with us, talking Sasquatch, and just an information filled first half hour with Thomas, and we're going to keep that going right now here my friend thomas thank you for joining us tonight thank you all right tell us about sasquatch island what makes this place so sasquatch friendly where is it what's it all about we're standing and sitting on it north america every indian a lot of indian tribes referred to north america as turtle island because of in the north of Canada, Hudson's Bay is the mouth of the turtle, the Aleutian Islands of Flipper, Labrador, Newfoundland of Flipper, the body, Canada, U.S. into Mexico, Baja, a flipper on the back, Florida, another flipper, Mexico, Central America, the tail of the turtle. I'm a Sasquatchologist, not a UFOologist. So how my ancestors knew that, I guess they went for a flight in a UFO, but I'm not going to get into it. But North America, Turtle Island, the native Indians, a lot of tribes referred to it. I call it Sasquatch Island because every Indian tribe has a name, perspectives, beliefs, encounter stories about their local Sasquatch, skunk ape, whatever they call it. And then everyone who isn't an Indian, Inuit, that have ancestors came here and the new people that still come here in immigration to this day, they have encounters with these big hair covered bipedal creatures and they have their stories and reports and so forth. So North America is Sasquatch Island. It's a continent, but it's still an island. It's surrounded in water. <laughs> Very true. I, you know, I never looked at it that way, my man. Never looked at it because I know you, I always thought, and, and pardon my ignorance on this, but when you talked about Sasquatch Island and I knew you always did a lot of research on Vancouver Island, I thought you were actually had an island that you nicknamed Sasquatch Island because there was so much action on an island up north there. Well, like anything with marketing, it's uh, about getting people to wonder and to reach out and communicate with you. So when I have people email me, message me, phone me, walk into me and go, where's Sasquatch Island? You're standing on it. And then I tell them why. And like you, they get, wow, I thought it was just one sole island. Well, yeah, it is North America, but... What about Vancouver Island? That's where you're from. I'm like, well, not me, but other people have coined the term Ape Island. So we'll just keep it at that, that Vancouver Island is referred to as Ape Island. Right. You have been investigating this creature all over the continent. And what differences have you learned from place to place? The ones up in the Northwest Territories, uh, when I lived up there for over a year, and the reports I got up there is they're very aggressive and really big. And uh, 
those ones like the native people taught me seems that they uh hibernate up there like they disappear during the winter time i don't blame them it was over 40 below when i was up there it's crazy cold and then uh you know you down in omaha when i saw two of them with the uh, mono fleur a uh, pregnant female over six foot and a big male her partner who was uh, probably over seven foot you know they weren't they're under 100 yards from us when we saw them in this flur and my god they, they were just they look similar to the ones in vancouver island region but what really caught me was their bubba gump's buddy with the big hang lip that's what they both looked like and they had really pronounced brow ridges and they had that sort of blazed donut face like uh someone who's you know you know mentally you know you know the fetal alcohol syndrome would be a good example you know i'm an indian you know i've seen a few people with severe fetal alcohol syndrome and that's what they reminded me of and right away it's you know when i was lying in bed late that night trying to sleep i'm trying to think why did they look like that it looked different than the Vancouver Island Sasquatch. So I got up and I went to my laptop and I pulled up Google Earth and I looked at Omaha Indian Reservation where I was. And after driving around it, I realized that the Omaha Indian Reservation still has the original hardwood, black walnut, chestnut, hardwood forest. But all around it is the forests have been leveled for industrial farms and it's just flatlands and farm fields so i think that on the omaha indian reservation there's so much activity on there it's crazy and uh you know we saw numerous flur hits that were more than likely sasquatches sitonga as they call them in omaha tongue but i think there's interbreeding going on there because it's this little enclave surrounded by iowa kansas to the south nebraska to the east and I think it's South Dakota to the north, but and cities up north. So to me, you know, it's something that really spooked me seeing that interbreeding where they had that really, like you see with interbred humans, that they had the same look, and it intrigued me. And you know, other places I've been in, you know, throughout the Pacific Northwest, North America, I even went to Salt Lake Fort Park. I believe that's Ohio. Yeah, Ohio. I went there for. Uh, 2017 for creature weekend it's one of my plaques on the wall but uh when i went there everyone was you know first night of course what do you do when you go to a sasquatch conference so you crack the beers and chatter chatter like a bunch of half cut sasquatches but the next night you know i went after we finished dinner and everything and interacting about 8 30 9 o'clock um i went to sleep and i got two hours sleep in and well uh, i went to the bar afterwards about 10 45 and everyone's hey tom sit down have a beer i'll buy you a beer like, it's all right i'll be back in a few minutes i'm going for a smoke well i actually went outside i'm in ohio i'm in a salt fork state park one of the well-known sasquatch hot spots am i gonna sit second night and drink beer with a bunch of drunks hell no i'm going investigating and what's the best place to look for investigating the Sasquatch at night? High abundant food source. So I went to a little hill just above the dumpsters behind the resort. And I sat there and I was downwind from the dumpsters because I could smell them and it smelled terrible because it was pretty warm. But uh, something came out after two hours sitting there around quarter to one in the morning. I could see something in the shadows and it was big and big shouldered and you see the head and you know i didn't see it clear enough maybe it was a sasquatch i went next day and did truthing and went and tracked and i'm a professional tracker because i was a grizzly bear black bear hunting guide for decades so i know how to track and i tracked and i went in the bush about 30 40 yards when i came across pretty respectable footprint about 14 inches long and was it what i saw sort of try to come out towards the dumpsters but there was a vehicle that was moving and it pulled back and about 10 minutes later tried again and there was people outside smoking doobies and you know making a bunch of noise and the thing just backed off and didn't go for the dumpsters and i was getting tired so i was just like 
I got to sleep. I got to perform in the morning and speak. So I better go to bed at you know, about 1 32 o'clock. And I didn't get to see my salt fork Sasquatch, but I sure as hell tried. And that's what a true investigator does, you know, always investigate. All right. I want to ask you, you know, about the Northwest Territories, because, you know, there's always the famous story about the Headless Valley and whether or not that is something, Thomas, that is a Sasquatch-like creature that doesn't want humans in its territory. And to this day, it's believed that, you know, any type of tour or any type of hiking is forbidden in that area because of the potential of violence and people being <laughs> and people being killed. I mean, what do you know about the headless Nahani Valley? I've been there. I wasn't Sasquatch investigating. I was hunting. And uh, all I can say about that area, because I keep getting that thrown at me by people like Stephen Major when I was working with him in Extreme Expeditions Northwest, did the uh, Portlock, Alaska documentary. Anyway, I had a falling out with him. I don't support him no more because he's a killer of Sasquatch. He wants to kill one. But anyway, he wanted to go in the hunt. And then this producer guy out of Los Angeles got a hold of me last year, contracted me up. Nothing came to be of it. And uh, uh, he wants wanted to go to Nahani Valley. And I got a Sasquatch Island uh, member from Vancouver Island. And he's retired from work. And he wants to go to the Nahani. And he can barely walk on Vancouver Island. And he wants to go to Nahani. Well, number one, with Nahani it is flipping huge. Like, Get on an airplane, fly from Edmonton to Whitehorse or Vancouver, British Columbia to Yellowknife and plan it for a good time with like in June or July when it's nice sunny weather and 24 hours sun up in the north. But when you fly over there, like I did when I went from Vancouver to Yellowknife my first time in uh, 2015, every time I go on an airplane, I'm a Sasquatch investigator. What does a Sasquatch investigator do when they're going to do a daylight? airplane ride at 30 whatever thousand feet up you are you bring binoculars you got to look down and truth that ground though because you might be boots on the ground there one time so when i was up there looking down at the nahani valley from an airplane i was like wow i was down there and that's where i started and that's where i went but it's just a little sliver section of what is this massive nahani valley so when you hear about it if you're going to go in there then, you know, number one, take two months of your life off and go in bush like I did f years ago for two months or longer and get into those extremely isolated places like I lived for months up in the alpines of uh, mainland British Columbia, coastal region off northeastern Vancouver Island. And you will see, smell, and hear things that at night, you know, you know what they are. And that's where the Sasquatches are. Sure, we hear about the ones that cross roads and are at their urban edge. You know, there's some urban habituated Sasquatches that come to our backyards while we're sleeping for the year-round abundant protein we produce in our compost, garden leftovers, pet food left out, feed sheds for livestock and poultry, uh, garbages. We have all this food we produce. So we do have the urban edge. But if you really want to try to find a Sasquatch in an isolated area, do you need to go to the Nihani Valley? Um, no. Go to Vancouver Island in a certain season. And the like, uh, best time is go in late May into late July and get up into the Alpines. And go spend weeks up there. Not a few hours, not a couple days leading up to almost a week. I mean some serious boots on the ground time. A couple, three weeks. And you will see here and smell them. They're up there. They're in the Honey Valley, but the Honey Valley is duplicated all through Sasquatch Island. Get to those areas that, you know, like I tell some guys that get a hold of me, like, what's the best way to find a Sasquatch? Rent a float plane and charter a float plane because they can pack 1,200 pounds overall with passengers. And you and two other buddies, because it's good to have two buddies with you, three people, because one guy's got to man the gun when things get sideways real quick with sasquatch or grizzly bears or whatever else the other guy's got to be loading the other gun when that one gets emptied and the third person's going to be sitting there videotaping what's taking place and you know because if you get into an incident with sasquatch as i have been 
it's like that quick. It goes from complete silence to all of a sudden shaking trees, things being thrown at you, charges coming at you. And with your heart pounding and your knees shaking and your throat getting dry in fear, when you're by yourself, as I've been in those situations, I never squeezed off. I sent a warning shot off once. But if you're going to go Sasquatch investigating, you better make sure you got three people to do exactly what I just outlined. The Honey Valley, well, you're going to have to look at ten dollars to $20,000 because you're going to want to get way up there, number one. It's going to cost you a few thousand bucks and you got to get back. And then you got to get on an airplane or a helicopter and get in deep. And once you're decked down, you're going to have to have about four to six days of no airplane noise or helicopter. And they've sort of forgot about you disrupting the whole valley where you got dropped off. And then you'll see in the second week into the third week that you're going to start to see, smell and hear things that why, my God, they are out here. And that's, so, you know, what do you think about the legend then that they are human killers ripping their oh, heads off? Everything is a human killer. The soccer team that crashed in the Andes showed us in the 1970s that we as humans can become cannibals really quick when starvation gets involved. 1947 was the last recorded incident of cannibalism in northern Canada's Inuit community when starvation set in. And even to this day, we know that there's some cannibalism taking place in area in Jaya and in uh, South America, and I hear even in Africa, and every other continent, excluding Antarctica, has cannibalism taken place with human rogues, ones that snapped upstairs and are psychopath cannibals. Everyone has them stories about that. So to me, when you hear about the Nahani, it's just one instance, you know, of someone and uh, next thing you know, you know, every Sasquatch in the Nahani is uh, popping off a human head, human killer. No, you know, we got two reports of that taking place in the Nahani. We have three missing people on Vancouver Island in the last 15 years, attributed, possibly attributed to being taken out by Sasquatches. We have Indian tribes in the Pacific Northwest and throughout Sasquatch Island that talk about Sasquatch that are with the basket, stealing bad children and eating them. You know, we call the Chonokwa, takes misbehaving children and consumes them in an invisible home high up in a mountain. And we hear of the rogues and, you know, Steve, uh, what's his name, David Pilates with his missing 411 book series and television shows. And he was on the Bigfoot cruise with us and I got to hang out with him for a second time, but really hang out with him. He had some pretty good stories. And, you know, how come all these people are going missing? Well, the Sasquatches like beans, human beans. And I belong to the Hamatsa Society. All I'm going to say to you is Hamatsa, H-A-M-A. T S A Hamatsa. I belong to that society of the Kwakwakiwak First Nation. When we dance to this day on the dance floors of the potlatches, the big house floors, and we show reenactment of what was ritualistic cannibalism from the ancestors of old. That's as far as I'll go with it because it's a secret society. You can read it all in a book called Hamatsa. You can Google it. But there's so many Indian tribes in North America pre-contact that practice eating human food and would or eating humans, cannibalism. They did it. They weren't hungry. They just did it because they like beans, human beans. And then there was the reports of the starvation times where they had to go resort to cannibalism. And then we look at modern times to this present where cannibalism still takes place. Even the ancestors from Europe, I've read the archeological reports and National Geographic editorials about bones being found in what used to be moats of castles and refuse heaps that showed the human bones marrowing, meaning they were smashed for the marrow to be eaten. There was scrape marks that they seen with the electron microscope on the human bones. And there was, charring marks on these human bones as well so cannibalism took place in europe at one time and in eastern asia and we also know it took place in other parts of asia like china and mongolia and kamchatka 
for different reasons. So nowadays we, oh no, cannibalism is so terrible. It's it's taboo to even talk about it. Oh, if you're going to be a Sasquatch investigator, you better start doing some research on cannibalism by our species because it'll give you a better understanding of how Sasquatch thinks and how they act and how they harvest. I agree with something that you said earlier as we got about four minutes to go before the break. Okay. And that is when I asked you about how Sasquatch are different in, in different territories that the more Northern, they're more aggressive. They seem to be more docile, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and California. You get around Texas, Louisiana, and those Southern states, they seem more aggressive and angry like the, the boggy Creek monster and, and creatures like that going into the skunk team of Florida. Okay. New York, they seem to be more elusive. I mean, how come do you think that we have so many different variations of this creature's attitude? In the Republican states where the hunters wear a lot of camel, the good old boys and girls, I've noticed that a lot of reports are very aggressive Sasquatch. Why? Because when you dig even deeper in those regions, Sasquatches have been shot at. But when you look at the Pacific Northwest, Northern Oregon, Washington State, British Columbia, Southeast Alaska, Western Alberta, Western Idaho, they're not passive. It's just so vast that interaction come across between human and Sasquatch hasn't been that much. So they haven't been subjected to the good old bow or wearing Cabela's camo shooting at him with a nine millimeter Glock or a rifle. And that's what I'm finding in my research. I studied the human in order to study the Sasquatch even more. Okay. So it's just a matter of territory and the people around it then that are yeah. causing. Yeah. How know, the like, humans are. Like I can understand the bayous. There's a lot of animals in there that, I mean, from copperhead snakes and, and alligators, alligator gar, wild boars. I can see a lot of these uh, Sasquatch getting pissed off with their environment because everything wants a brawl. Okay. Uh, but, you know, the human aspect of it, I can also understand that as well. And I think that's, that's a smart point to make on that. Is there, or do you then recommend with two minutes to go here that people go search for this creature if they're curious? Yes. But what they need to do is email me so they can get a copy of my guidelines to chance encounters and investigating a Sasquatch, also known as Bigfoot. I have, after all my 58 years on this planet and everything I've seen to date, I want to have people understand the Sasquatch commandments that we have to adhere to. One of them, number one, always show respect no killing, no harm or trapping, keep a respectful, safe distance, uh, personal protection devices while in close proximity. We learned from COVID all about that and respect your fellow investigators. So, you know, that's what people need to understand. And, you know, it's gonna, that, I think that's the best way to answer your question. I love it. I do. Okay. So the, the idea then being that you could go look for it, but, but just know what you're doing. Like yeah. for us, like for us, for instance, the spot that the couple spots that we have, we don't go searching the trails. We let it come to us. We do everything the same. We park in the same spots. Our campfire is always in the same area. Our chairs are in the same area. We don't go wandering off because the one thing I do know about this creature is it, it is very curious. You're one of the few humans I ever heard say what has to be done, that always go to the same area, chairs in the same spots. Me, I go to the same trail down to my cabins, gun at the same place against that spruce tree. They even bring me in kindling. I'll go down there in two weeks from now, and there'll be piles of spruce branches piled up around my fire area so that they're helping me start a fire. Why? They're not allowed to have fires, but they must enjoy sitting there as we know they do watching us at the fire pit, enjoying our fire and our chatter chatter as well. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, I learned that from Robin McRae or Ma Robin Haynes now is her name about, you know, don't, you don't need to go. They are going to come. And, and you know where yeah. I noticed we get a lot of the action. We only got 10 seconds here when my son is around. When my 10 year old son is around, it seems like they are a lot more active 
when the Sasquatch children Sasquatch loves children. Well, let's find out when we return on Spaced Out Radio for hour number two with legendary researcher Thomas Seawood. We're all on Sasquatch Island. We learned that tonight here in North America. I love that. Love it. A great time talking Sasquatch, Bigfoot, and more. With Thomas Seawood, hour number two of Spaced Out Radio comes right after this. All right, Tom, we got about five minutes here. So hey, I'm going to have a quick pee and a smoke. Yeah, I will. Uh, I'm going to put you in the green room and I'll be right back as well, everybody. Stay tuned for hour number two next.
All right. Good to have you all here. Maeve O'Brien, welcome to SOR Chat. Hi, Nikki in Seattle. Who else has joined us here? Deborah Norsworthy, welcome. And Bad Daddy, good to see you. All right, Matt Geek, nice to see you. Thomas, we got you back on here. Yep. And, uh, yeah. Preacher, how's the autographs going? Just want to make sure you're doing all right there and not getting overwhelmed. Thank you, Super Duke. Hey, I want to remind everybody that the Super Chat is open. Pam Harris, thank you for kicking things off tonight. Appreciate your love and support. Also, guys, our store is open on our website for great swag. I added a hoodie yesterday with our logo on it. It's very nice. Very nice. You can pick it up. And also, on your calendar, mark May 10th through 12th, 2024, we are all heading to Reno, Nevada for the third annual SOR fan party. You, it's not a conference. It's about hanging out with people that you see on this show. We're going to have a bunch of special guests. We are going to have uh, a live radio show that you can attend and you can meet up the, with the VIP party. Tickets are 100 bucks. Silver Legacy Casino and Resort. That's the, the rooms right now, if you go register right now, are like 139 bucks a night. We want to see you there. Here we go with hour two. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Let's kick off hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. Really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, TalkStream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. You can join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Cacolette. Cacolette is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as a clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and you can join me on Patreon in the SOR Space Travelers Club. All right, let's move it forward. Thomas Seawood is our guest tonight. We're talking Sasquatch all night long, and thank you, Thomas, for being here and such an awesome guest each and every time you're on the show. Okay, it's, it's fun. I'll say that. It is fun. And right before the break, I had mentioned to you, we were talking about my Sasquatch site that I have, and I mentioned to you the fact that my son is very very into sasquatch number one he saw the big guy with us last year we saw the 10 footer and then heard his friend way in the forest but what is it about children that really seems to excite sasquatch it seems to bring them in and you could feel them around you could hear them moving through the trees what is it about kids well, number one, that's why I only harvest spike bucks when I go deer hunting. If I eat deer, they're tender. They, they don't have that wild, ruddy, gamey taste. And I can imagine kids are the same way, probably pretty tender and not so spicy with all the decades of fast food and tobacco and chewing tobacco going into that meat. That's one way of looking at it. The other way I look at it is when you're playing bush chess, trying to get close to a Sasquatch group, number one, you they're like uh adam they have the nucleus of the atom that's the the young the females the sick the elderly sasquatches around them the electrons and protons would be your harvesters hunters and your scouts and hunters of course are probably going beyond the perimeters of the scout circle so that when sasquatches in the daytime in our region they'll look up 
for a prominent knoll, a high hill, a mountain peak, not so much a mountain, but a low mountain, you know, I'm talking under 2,000 feet, and they're harvesting shellfish or herring spawning down on the beach at night during the low tide, and daytime when the humans are about, just before daylight, they go up the knoll, and the nucleus of the atom, the family clan, the elders young and sick, they're on the top of the mound. Around that are the scouts, and then harvesters, hunters, when they wake up, are below that and around it. But all of a sudden, bang, tree knock, uh, whoop, uh, whistle, uh, mimic of an animal, a bird. That's Morse code. That's communication to the nucleus. Be on guard. There's a perceived threat. When the hunter or scout makes the next alarm that get out of there. On top of the knoll, they have 360 degree observation by eye, nose, and ears. But they also have 360 or 300 degrees of BD, get the hell out of here, away from the perceived threat or the threat. So that's where Sasquatches are. So when you're trying to get close to a Sasquatch group, do we see the children? The only time we see infant children is a chance encounter. Uh, one happens, doesn't know you're there, and she's out harvesting, and all of a sudden, oh, there's the human, and it bends down behind the rock and picks up its baby and holds it, Independence Day video. And uh, the one Dr. John Bindernagel invited me to his house and the facts had come in. So I drove to Courtney to see this picture of a Sasquatch taken by a camera from a guy's window of a Sasquatch bending down and picking up apples that had fallen out of the tree. And I was the first one to see that three days after it was taken, where John and I were looking at it. And I'm like, John, look, it's got a baby in it. Un is cradling it cr under its arm and on its back. It's got a baby. And to this day, that picture is known as a Sasquatch female with a baby as she's harvesting apples. So very low numbers of reports of juvenile, elderly, sick Sasquatch, unless it's a chance encounter, just fleeting, crossing a road, a path, getting the hell away from the human. We've never heard reports of a lot of juveniles. We have uh, an audio recording of uh, a bunch of chattering, and it sounds like females and juveniles, but we don't have the video of it yet or pictures. Why? Because the harvesters, hunters, and scouts have already bingoed the human. Boom, Morse code. The clan unit, like an atom, just moved away. We never see the children. So can you imagine what it's like for a Sasquatch who's out harvesting or hunting or being a scout, and all of a sudden it hears high-pitched, Ch ch uh, twittering and chirping, laughing of children, crying, screaming. You know what kids sound like? You know, they can sound cute, and other times they're irritating as all hell. But to the Sasquatch, because they know what their family dynamics, clan dynamics are like, that they will never allow a threat, especially humans, to ever get near the nucleus of the Adam clan. Well, all of a sudden, we dumb humans, we're out there letting our kids play in a playground with a forest edge like they did in Vancouver Island. And all of a sudden, one of the mothers goes, oh, my God, look, and points up the bank above the community center on Vancouver Island east side. And there's a big Sasquatch looking at all these kids playing in the playground. Well, now you drive by that very place and all the trees have been removed for about 60 yards, meters into the forest because of that Sasquatch encounter. So that's why Sasquatches are so intrigued by children. Number one, we they would never allow us to see that nucleus, the children. Yet here we are allowing them to see our children because we're not so defensive as they are because we're in the forest, the beach, enjoying ourselves in the daylight. Sasquatches live out there without a house and a nine millimeter Glock and a 357 Magnum pistol, as a lot of people do, or 911 to phone the police to come protect you. So they have to live and move like a military unit, always on the defense. And that's why we never see their children and why they're so intrigued by seeing ours, because we're foolish enough to allow them to penetrate our boundaries and be able to see and hear and smell our children. And that's why they're so curious. You know, to them, it's just like, wow, you can imagine a Sasquatch clan out in their environment, deep in bush. And 
do they see the other clan, the neighboring clan's nucleus, children, elderly, sick, females? No, because the harvesters, hunters, and scouts are ensuring that any perceived threat isn't coming close to that nucleus where the children are. And yet here we humans just do it all the time. And that's why they're so curious. Do you believe then that Sasquatch does feed off of humans? Like, do they look at us as a food source? I mean, you talked about cannibalism a little bit earlier on in the show, but I mean, with children and, and a lot of David Politis's stories about children who just vanish, are, are the children treated as, as like you said, maybe a fresh food source or are they treated that maybe a mother lost her own child and is looking for a, a replacement how do how do we look at this you got to look at it like i do because of my experience living in bush for so long like when i go to the bush and i used to do survival training with the military in canada uh different uh contingents of it but uh i remember one time we got dropped off for a three-week bush survival in northern vancouver island and me and my cousin we had our packs weighed in at under 20 pounds and everyone else was weighing between 60 and 80 plus pounds and we didn't bring any food you know we brought coffee tobacco and our bush kit which is a tarp and a wool blanket and we wore our clothes mustang floater coats underneath the hoodie t-shirt and that tarp and that blanket and then our tarp was our sleeping bag tent we didn't bring everything else those other guys did because they were thinking like concreters you know got to have my tent got to have my air mattress got to have my dehydrated food have to have my stove have to have this we didn't bring that and even the instructor said you were supposed to bring a fire stick or something to make a fire and we said yeah we did we brought two big lighters each one big lighter it lasts you over two months in the forest and that's even being a smoker you know have you ever looked at a lighter and lighting your cigarette every day and recorded how long that lighter lasts they last three months for a cigarette smoker so two lighters is a great fire starter one of them's in a ziploc bag with some punk some uh sap wood to start a fire quick and the other one's in your pocket so if one gets wet what do you do when your lighter gets wet well you just find a piece of dry cloth your clothing and you just roll the thing the stripe the roller and it dries off real quick now you can light it <laughs> so with the sasquatches out there living out there you know when they go after humans and a lot of them children go missing you know number one they're light they're easy to pack you know that's why i shoot one spike deer who wants a pack of five spike weighing 220 pounds cleaned you know to get a one spike i just throw it over my shoulder and carry it out you know it's the size of a german shepherd but it gives me enough meat the last couple of weeks and uh it's tender and then with children you know you ever picked up a uh, baby raccoon you know even when they're about that big size of a wiener dog that, that little son of a gun gonna rip your hand apart they're so vicious and mean so the sasquatch is thinking like that so when they go after a human if they go after someone like me, 175 pounds, I might have a pocket knife, gouge out their eyes, cut an artery, maim them, get infection, die. So I'm a not a good option for harvesting. But all of a sudden, they come across a young child lost in the woods or whatever, or the family's not paying attention. Well, like a baby raccoon, it's, you know, it's not if it's a really small raccoon like that it's not going to rip your hand apart a small human ain't going to bite your face apart and claw your eyeballs out and it's easy to cover its mouth and it can fight all it wants but it's under 60 pounds it's an easy pack like my one spike buck over my shoulder compared to a big buck so that's how a sasquatch thinks and that's what i i teach people is think like a Sasquatch in order to get close and find a Sasquatch. I love it. I absolutely love it. Thomas Seawood is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I got a lot of requests from people asking you to tell the garlic story. <laughs> garlic story. Yeah, we were 2012. 
of me and my cousin Darcy and his uh, half brother working for our tribe called a band in Canada, 250 acre island of ours, which is an Indian reserve. We were going to build five, well, we ended up building the five cabins looking like in our ceremonial big houses, but smaller. And we had to go in and clear the forest, all the bushes, all the older trees. And uh, while we we're getting the camp ready in 2012 for the construction, because we Hannibal pre-built everything on Vancouver Island. We're going to bring it out with a landing craft for the crane and then lift the walls and place and floors and yada, yada, yada. But anyway, we had an outside kitchen between two big spruce trees that were about three foot in diameter. We just built a bench and put a tarp roof on it. And we had a lock box with a wire on it twisted where our garlic was and our apples and other foods. You know, it was bear proof, we thought. And uh, we'd cook on this open table and there'd be crumbs and you'd see mice on there and all that. And, you know, the garlic was going missing. And I was like, you guys quit leaving the garlic out. The mice are taking it. You know, we're eating a lot of sh big prawns, and shrimp and crab. You got to have garlic when you're eating seafood like that. So, and uh, our garlic kept going missing. So between the cabins, when we started building them, you know, you can picture the eaves troughs three feet apart and the walls six feet apart well we put a picnic table between the two cabins and in the front of the cabins because of the wind coming in we put up windows in there just temporary you know framed aluminum windows we screwed into the walls to break the wind and we could also see out if anyone came into the bay and we put a wood stove in this area that we had and so the heat would stay in that confined area and we'd sit there playing crib eating the whole nine yards and you know one night we had the uh, garlic go missing again and I'm giving the boys crap for getting our garlic left out and the mice are taking it. And so I said, well, let's put a garlic clove and on the table where our propane stove would sit and everything. And we put a glass upside down and uh, I said, let's see if it's the mice. I kind of think it might be Sasquatch. So not even a half an hour goes by and John goes, I'm going to the, kitchen i'm gonna go get a pepsi anyone else i'm like yeah grab me one and he goes from behind the cabins goes by and i was like i'm running back the garlic's gone from under the glass so we all run back out there three of us and sure enough there's the glass upside down no garlic and we knew john wasn't there long enough to even he said i didn't even get near it he's i just saw it empty he turned and ran and got you guys i stupidly grabbed the cup what i should have done was I should have cleaned the cup before I put it upside down or the glass because it was clear. And when it was empty of a garlic, I should have put it in a Ziploc bag and brought it to Alert Bay to the police station and got them to take fingerprints. Can you imagine what we would have seen on that glass? So that's how our garlic was going missing. And then the thing was even going into the lockbox and twisting the wire and opening the lid. But like we see with Sasquatch encounters coming to take our food, fruit, and vegetables and things, they never take all of it. They're very respectful to leave us, you know, usually the majority. So we'd notice that our apples, would, and we counted them, go from roughly 15 apples down to 11. Our garlic cloves in a big bag would go from seven down to five. And we knew the son of a gun was taking garlic. But a lot of people ask me about that. Why would they take garlic? Well, some people believe it's medicinal. But in coastal British Columbia, we have, I believe, three different types of garlic that are natural to our our ocean sea level environment. And uh, I always tell people when, you know, like a lot of people gift. I don't think gifting should take place of foods unless it's something they're accustomed to. So Vancouver Island. Uh, we have plum trees, apple trees, pear trees, crab apple trees, cherry trees, things that are natural in the environment for generations since contact and even before. And so try to bring them something from the grocery store that's from that area. But can you imagine to a Sasquatch right now in November and all of a sudden you bring them in some Argentinian or wherever in the Southern Hemisphere cherries come from this time of year. I saw, you know, grapes and the grocery store this evening but can you imagine bringing them cherries or plums in november through until may when they're not naturally grown in that environment well 
that's why Sasquatches and the urban edge, the ones I study now, because my knee is getting so bad in my right my right leg because of age and broken down commercial fishermen and diabetes, I can't get up to the alpines like I used to. So now I'm concentrating and putting my chips on the urban edge because they're coming into our backyards while we're farting and snoring in our REM sleep after 1130 at night. So two hours before, an hour before daylight, the Sasquatches are in our backyards, feed sheds and so forth. But one of the big things we're finding them hitting on is our compost boxes. Can you imagine being a Sasquatch thinking like a Sasquatch? You have to, and you open a compost lid or one of those spinny barrel lids and there's a soft tomato that we threw away because it was soft and had a little bit of mold on the side. There's cantaloupe rinds. We ate the meat, the cantaloupe, but there's still meat and rind left and potato peelings. And the list goes on what we put in our compost boxes to a Sasquatch. That's like going to an Indian tribe casino and hitting the buffet table, man. That's like, it's on like Donkey Kong. I'm feasting tonight. Five composts along this urban edge at the edge of the forest backyards. I got a full belly of some pretty exotic foods. It's most of them. I didn't know what the hell they were, but dang, they tasted good. That's how a Sasquatch thinks and how they harvest. Three minutes to go before we have to go to break at the bottom of the hour. Thomas Seawood is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Thomas, you know, as we take a look at this creature uh, all around North America, and, you know, you've talked about its feeding areas, you've talked about its breeding areas. Do they breed like humans? Do we know how they breed? How often they're <laughs> breeding? Do we know they're just, they're cycling? Uh, do we know any of this? Well, we as a species, the only one that will fornicate for pleasure. And, you know, dolphins do too, in the most part. And then when we look at our, our apex predators and apex omnivores, they breed for strengthening the tribe, pack animals, only the head wolf, male and female can breed. The other ones can't. So it's with the wolf pack, uh, Predators, packs, lions, hyenas, so forth. Breeding is strict. Only the strong ones can do it. Only the select leaders of the pack. Because that is survival of the species. It is, ensures the strongest gene pool for breeding. It ensures there's no starvation within the pack. It's curtailed because there's not 50 infants. So... I think Sasquatch thinks on that same level, whether it be instinctual or learned um, hap by uh, learned by uh, behavior through generations. And because of the reports that we get, we you know where have we heard a report of over half a dozen Sasquatch juveniles from infant to young adolescent seen? We have a lot of reports, and Ostrom is a great one from Butte, Toba Inlet, British Columbia, where he got apprehended in a sleeping bag by a big male Sasquatch, brought to his cave area up in the mountains, and that family unit had a adolescent juvenile male and a younger, smaller juvenile adolescent female. And then we can correlate that to numerous other reports from Albert Ostrom in the early 1900s to present. And that's indicative of most reports, uh, one or two offspring in that family unit. Not like when we go to some places and see some families that aren't well educated, and I'm not going to say what uh, race, but just humans of different color. And uh, we see that they got eight dozen kids. You know, you just roll your eyes and shake your heads and like, are you stupid and idiot or all of the above? You're on welfare and you got a dozen well, kids. Let's keep it. Let's keep it off the political side here. Yeah. We only have about thirty seconds, but just you, your your thoughts on 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 how they do it. I think it's very strict. Remember what Lucas taught us. They have laws, very strict laws. So I think the breeding is really, it's really curtailed within their clan to the head one and head female. Love it. Thomas, we got you for another 30 minutes here on Spaced Out Radio, and it's been an amazing, amazing time here so far with you here. And, uh, you know, when we return, we're going to find out a little bit more about what you think. 
just your thoughts on this creature overall. Will it ever come into fruition where we know its true existence? If you've seen it, you know it, it's there. If you haven't, you're still probably a non-believer. But we're still searching for Sasquatch on Spaced Out Radio. We will be right back. Sorry about that. I just got to try it for my radio stations. Keep it as apolitical oh, as yeah. possible. Yeah. No, I'm only human. I make mistakes. Oh, yeah. No problem, buddy. <laughs> I learned we're from gonna, it. We're gonna get How many minutes? Much. We got about four and a half minutes if you want to go for a dart. Yeah. Aboriginal moment. Smoke tobacco. <laughs> All right. Good show. Good show. We having fun yet? <laughs> so yes, let's get back to Reno 2024, third annual spaced out radio fan party. Who's coming? 100 bucks a ticket. This is what you get. You get a swag bag. You get a live radio show to sit in. We're going to invite in a bunch of our guests that you see on this show. So far, Science Bob, Lala Bright, Tim Senor, Melinda Leslie, Geraldine Orozco, Jim Goodall, Tom Whitmore. They're all going to be there so far. That list we plan on growing eric markham the preacher is going to try and get there i think he will because he's tough as nails okay and this is what you get okay you get the swag bag you get the free radio show that we are going to record live hey the beard how you doing you're going to get the vip party you are going to get a ghost tour with merle yeah merle's coming Melinda well, Leslie, that night on Saturday, will do a UFO sky watch. Then on Sunday, it's a free for all. If you got to head home because you got to work on the Monday, well, you head on home. If you're staying until the Monday like we are, then you party with us all day and all night long. It's just that simple. 100 bucks a ticket. Send if you're interested. Send your inf information to info at spacedoutradio.com. Okay. Hey, Derek Galloway. And by the way, it's at the Silver Legacy Casino and Resort. And get your hotel book now. Like, seriously. It's only like $139 a night. It's like double the cost less in Reno than it was in Vegas last year. And we want to see you all there. So get to it. May 10th through 12th in Vegas. Thank you, Tim Mothman, for posting that. Sarah Yan, how you doing? Good to see you. All right. I will get to some audience questions when we come back. Maureen, you should come. It's a fun time. I'm going to be making a list of people who are going to come. So, yeah. We'll get that list up there. Hi, Derek. I love you. From Desiree. All right. Super Chat is open. And thank you to Pam H. For our lone single Super Chat tonight. Very much appreciate it, Pam. Thank you for the love and support. And go shopping at our Spaced Out Radio store. By the way, Human Carl, the latest member of the SOR Space Travelers Club. Thank you, Human Carl. You're fantastic. Not to be misconstrued with alien Carl, human Carl. Human Carl. We love him around here. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. 
We got one minute here. Derek, you're not in the hammock. You're in the swing. You're in the swing. Desiree's just rolling her eyes at hubby Derek. All right, everybody. Here we go. Oh, sorry. We got like 25 seconds. Preacher, thank you for that super chat, Preacher. I love you, buddy. Look at that. Not only does he sign autographs, but he hits up a nice super chat there, too. All right. Five seconds. Here we go. Here we go as we're at the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears. Reminder to all of you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and then join us on Patreon in the SOR Space Travelers Club. We got a great show. We got until the top of the hour. Bigfoot researcher, investigator, not researcher, <laughs> investigator. <laughs> our, our good friend, Thomas Seawood. How you doing, my man? Doing good. All right. I'm glad to have you here as well. I mean, you have made this a wonderful, wonderful show. So thank you for that. I want to get to some audience questions for you. Uh, this starts with the preacher. Did the tradition of the Wendigo come from guilt over cannibalism during bad winters? Um, I Good question. I asked my mom, who's Cree Indian, about Wittigo. That's how we say it in our Cree dialect from central Saskatchewan, where my mom's from. But I asked her quite a few questions about it, and then looking into some reports about a week ago, you know, skeletal form, stinky hides hanging off it, deer or elk head, skull, antlers on its head, and fierce eyes, gauntal face, and uh, very aggressive, and limping with a stick in some cases, wanting to eat the humans. And right away, I thought, you know, because I'm not into the woo, the spiritual esque part of Sasquatch, because I've never had an experience like that. And, you know, if I do see an orb or whatever, or cloak or have mind speaking, then I'll be a believer of that. But I'm just a critterist. So looking at it from a critterist Sasquatch investigations perspective and being a bear hunting guide for decades and seeing some emaciated, I think the word is the bears, black and grizzly with you can see the tapeworms are just consuming them from the inside and the hookworms and the flukes inside them. And they got a big bubble on the side of their face because they got abscessed teeth. And I found dead ones like that where they got very little teeth and they're abscessed and they're skeletal and everything. I look at Wheatago as the very old Sasquatch that has the worms, has the diseases. Uh, probably has cataracts and can't see. So it can't hunt like it used to when it was very robust. And it was possibly a clan leader male that got ousted from a clan decades before. And now it's elderly, like an old grizzly bear will team up with an old wolf. And we've seen that with the guy from Finland with his pictures. And I've seen it three times in my time out in bush, how old wolf will team up with old grizzly bear and hunt and work together. I think the old, emaciated, diseased, wormed up, cataract, arthritis, Sasquatch can't catch the game like it used to. Maybe can't even dig roots because it can't see properly, but it can see and go after those humans. And all of a sudden it takes old hides off carcasses, carrion, 
and wears them because it's cold. It's skeletal. It's lost a lot of body fat. And that's why it's wearing these stinky hides. And then it knows that humans are scared of Sasquatch, number one. But he knows that he's not that scary looking because of all this way he looks. He puts on that deer antler and ties it to his head because we know they have opposable thumbs. They can tie knots. And we have out in the coast reports of them making cedar bark three um, three uh, braided ropes and opening up my lock box, which had twisted wire, opposable thumb. And there's a whole other list of things they do that shows it could tie a skull to its head. And now when the humans are out there picking blueberries for example in early summer they're on their squatting down they've got their heads down to the ground and moss and they're pick 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 and all of a sudden they look up and there's this oh my god it's a week ago it's got this deer skull it's got the stinky hides it's got a club and the next thing you know one of the people in the group maybe a child or a young person or elderly one got taken out by that week ago and the week ago starving What's it going to do as soon as it smashes the skull with the club or bangs its skull and against a tree? It's going to eat those brains. That's the high nutrient part of any animal. And that's why pack animals like wolves and uh, lions will eat the brains. The head female and male eat the brains because that's the highest concentration of nutrients in that body. So when the humans are running away and they're seeing that wheat to go, all of a sudden it becomes this demon spirit with this deer skull and club that was consuming our ancestor, our family members' brains and gouging the eyes out and eating them. That's bush survival. That's how you eat an animal when you're starving. You go after the high nutrients. You want that body of yours to kickstart with the eyeballs and the brain matter and the liver, the kidneys, the heart. And that's what my perspective is from my investigating about what a week ago is. And I believe that's a emaciated, diseased, infested on its last few years or months of life, Sasquatch. Okay, continuing on, let us go to Dave, who is asking, Hey, Thomas, what have you been told or experienced along the coastal Alaskan panhandle encompassing many islands? overrun with sasquatches <laughs> um i communicate um you know modern day smoke signal facebook messenger you know i'll get pings coming in 24 hours a day from people all over sasquatch island mainly from the coastal regions because i'm you know not being egomaniac anyway but i am one of those sasquatch celebrities and because i'm a fellow north american indian they trust me more than they do the non-Indian. And uh, so they'll phone me and, hey, Tom, listen. And I'll listen at two in the morning to the Sasquatch vocalization. I'm like, where are you calling me from again? I'm calling you from this Indian village in Southeast Alaska. Well, go outside and see if you can videotape it. No way, man. I'm not going out there. Too scary. So I'm getting reports from all over. But I've been through southeast alaska and it is really desolate like i'm talking miles upon miles like coastal british columbia where you don't see humans and uh you know if you want to find sasquatch i always say go to coastal pacific northwest from washington state up to southeast alaska where there's high abundant shellfish beaches in months with no r so in other words from Se or september to march april that's the time of low sun, which means less photoplankton, which means a clam's belly isn't filled with the green plankton and it tastes like that green plankton and smells like it. And your clam chowder in June will look like green, ugh, tastes terrible. Sasquatches know that. And plus, there's a greater chance of having paralytic shellfish poisoning in months with no R, red tide. Sasquatches know that. So from September through until April, get out to the beaches, look at a tide book, go when the extreme low tides of zero or minus tides are taking place at night and where you know there's abundant shellfish, especially cockles, a favorite shellfish of the Sasquatches in the Pacific Northwest, go there and, and you'll, you'll hear them, smell them, possibly see them. That's where we're putting our chips when we go out. That's why we do a lot of boat-based uh, Sasquatch expeditions during fall into early spring. Okay, let's continue on. Let's go to Susie, 
who is asking, Thomas, can you elaborate on why they come to us in dreams, some people? So that I can flail my arms around and hit my wife. <laughs> so we have a wall of fellows between us and our king size. That's where my Sasquatch demons come at me in my dreams. Um, I don't, like I say, I'm, I don't get into the woo-woo spiritual aspect. Um, so to me, if they came into my dreams like that, and I've lived in bush for years and, you know, wake up and you lick your fingers and shove them in your nose to get your hair follicles in your nose moist so you can smell better. That's why bears and other animals like wolves and coyote lick their nose so they can smell better. You know, I'll wake up and do that. And all of a sudden you get that tang of that nasty human body odor times 20 to 30 times worse. And you know, there's a Sasquatch upwind to you or downwind of you smelling you. And then all of a sudden that little swirl breeze came and that's what woke you up was that smell. Your bush senses are, you know, they're firing in all cylinders. You know, you're, you're, you're on edge in the bush on guard. And all of a sudden, you know, there's a Sasquatch there and, uh, you know, you're questioning about why do they come to us in dreams? Well, living in the bush for years and having dreams every night. I never had Sasquatch come to me in the dreams other than when I'm here and they chase me. Well, you know what? You talked a little bit earlier. You'd mentioned about uh, not telepathy, but mind speak. I look at my son and we were standing in the forest at our, at our gifting site. My buddy and I were sitting on his tailgate. My son is playing on his, in this dirt mound that he had built. And there's a bunch of ants in there and he likes to, you know, play King Kong with the ants. And my buddy heard a snap to the left of us, you know, probably 50, 60 feet into the trees. And my, and he kind of points, he goes, there's something over there real quiet. My son who's about 25 feet away. You know, he didn't really hear my buddy whisper like 10 seconds later. He's like, dad. I'm like, yeah. And he points to the same exact area where my buddy just pointed out. He goes, they're here. And they've told me they're watching us. And I look at my son. My son is not, he's a very calm, cool, collective, never gets too high, never gets too low kind of kid. He's not one who has a wild and crazy imagination. And sure enough, we started hearing noise from that area quite often right after that. So, you know, I, I understand where you are on the woo side. Okay, and I never question that because we're all allowed our own opinions. This is where your research has led you. But in something like that mind speak, because once again, it's a child thing. Could that be possible? So my son has a gift and he doesn't exercise it. I don't see him that much no more. He's 22 now. But anyway, when he was a young boy out in the bush, he had some one, actually twice like that. and. He also used to see the ancestors. He would make these elaborate with a coat hanger, like hangers of coral and bones and shells and you name it. And even some of the people when we moved to Haida Gwaii when he was uh, five years, um, uh, 2007, he was seven years old. Some of the elders up there, the Haida nation said that your son has gifts. He's an old soul inside. Now, when I look at, the numerous reports and I actually saw one last night on TikTok. Yeah, I follow TikTok and great Sasquatch groups on there. But anyway, um, this young kid grabbed her mother and brought her into a room and that old person keeps smiling at me from the closet. And that goes into how many hundreds of reports have we heard about children communicating and seeing ghosts. I believe in ghosts to a certain extent. So to me, I leave it open that Children are so perfect and pure and so new. And we have so many reports of them interacting with, be it ghosts, spirits, entities, demons, and uh, Sasquatch. So I just leave that door open to, I'm no longer a child, but uh, uh, I'd like to document something where there's that, what your son experienced. And I think it did take place. I think there was possibly a communication from a Sasquatch to your son. Yeah, it was pretty cool when that happened. Yeah. I will say this. Uh, the preacher wants to know, are they attracted to human music? 
Yes, definitely. As long wow. as it isn't bongo drums. You ever hear of hippies running into Sasquatches? <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to ask you, though, what about laughter? Because I have, I noticed that, you know, if my friends and I are sitting around the fire and we're having a good time, we're telling some stories and having a good laugh, that always seems to be an attractant. Why, what's, is it the power of laughter, the, the sound of it? When I, mainly when I get women reach out to me with an encounter report, there's questions I ask them, and that's one of them. Was there a lot of female laughter at the time? There's no children present, so um, is there any female laughter? Oh, yeah, me and my girlfriends are sitting around the campfire in my backyard, and we're all just sipping wine and laughing and having fun. And, yeah, I hear that in a lot of the reports because I ask the in-depth questions that most investigators won't ask like one of the questions uh, she's a good friend of mine now a first nations woman who's a, a professor at university of british columbia now she's a doctor and when she reached out to me that she had something taken place in her backyard and she believed it was sasquatch and uh i asked her i said never met her i said uh, when you're out there in the backyard gardening or going down the railway tracks into the forest harvesting your traditional medicinal plants and edible foods i said uh do you have big boobs and she says um, yeah i'm well endowed i said do you ever go with a uh, bra bikini top or topless when you're in the garden in the backyard and she goes mm, bikini top definitely and i'm like okay what color is your hair and she goes well i just dyed it it's uh, black with red really scarlet red streaks in it i'm like yeah i think you've got a young male sasquatch and uh you know asking that kind of question you know why would someone ask that well because men are men and when it's sasquatch is coming in you're dumb de de generally dealing with a male scout or a hunter so if you're a adolescent hunter it means you're not the dominant male of the clan which means you don't have a mate and so you're out doing your job you're hunting but you're young, you're full of hormones, and all of a sudden there's female laughter. It draws you in because what does female la laughter give you? It gives you visual enjoyment of seeing what they like. You know, males are males. Some like big bosoms, some like no, some like blondes, some like brunettes, yada, yada, yada. He when you look at Sasquatch like I do, as they're human, that's the kind of questions you've got to come to mind with is what's attracting them yes it's female laughter why well how many men go down the beach because there's bikinis well, how many sasquatch get attracted to female laughter because there's females to look at and enjoy visually you know, it's one of the things that i do now it opens up the thing like where i was out with uh some investigators one time and we left cam river going west across the island to gold river and halfway there along the campbell lake windy twisty steep wall above steep bank down to the lake i know the pullovers i'm like pull over on this corner there's a cement barriers there there's a bit of gravel pull over i gotta pee so we pulled over because i had too many coffee and we're all doing our business and no cars are going by and all of a sudden i was like hey you guys come look there's sasquatch tracks in the pea gravel over the cement barrier <laughs> three feet high and lo and behold the tracks go up to toilet paper bundles from females who squatted and peed and we could see the knee marks and the hand marks where that sasquatch knelt down and smelt the female toilet paper sound gross no it's human instinct it's animal instinct it's why deer do what they do and elk when rut season's on men do the same thing that are humans and sasquatch i'm finding in my investigations because now i'm hitting all the pullover spots because a lot of women won't go into the vancouver island highway outhouses because they stink so they'll go piddle in the bushes beside it or whatever and that's where i find the toilet paper piles and i'm finding sasquatch evidence tracks you know they're pigs just like any other male <laughs> I would have never thought of that, but that, that makes so much sense let's go to nina here we got five minutes to go do sasquatch have a common language yes they have the their language and they also understand the language of the traditional indian tribe who's shared their territory since the dawn of our creation sasquatch and indian tribe so learn the local indian tribe hello how you doing i come in peace i mean no harm and then when you have that 
know there's a Sasquatch close at hand, speak to them in that local Indian dialect, and you will be amazed what comes back at you. Okay. I, I got a couple of questions here before I get back to the audience. What are signs that we can look for in the forest? Okay. Like what attracted us to our area where we are now researching was we had in a row, probably a hundred, 200 meters apart, not apart, but in, in a line, we had three giant X's that were wound into trees. What is something that we, the normal person who wouldn't maybe notice take note of to notice if they're in a Sasquatch area? Um, number one, don't look at tree structures. I've been in the forest during hurricane winds and seen downdrafts do amazing things. And afterwards, it looked like a clan of Sasquatches went in and uh, smoked a couple doobies and started making tree structures. So, and a lot of them are natural. And also some of them are decoys so that you're looking at the tree structure they may have made. So it draws you away from where there's a ledge that leads down to an area where they sleep above a salmon stream or a pond or whatever. So I've noticed in a couple of occasions, tree structures are decoys that get you away from when I actually backtracked and looked around 360 degrees, I found where there was a Sasquatch nesting area. Um, tree structures also are birthing huts and menstrual huts for female Sasquatches. So when you study the anthropological path of the indigenous tribes of North America, Sasquatch Island, and you find that even to this day, some tribes practice the first menstruation, the female is sort of ostracized from the clan and is in their own little place, be it in a smokehouse, a big house, long house, or some part of the community. So when you see a tree structure, TP, lean to, that's where female blood is. And as an Indian, you don't want to be anywhere near female blood, especially when you're going to go hunting. It's taboo. It'll spoil your hunting for months, years, and down the line. So to me, in my investigations, tree structures generally are a place where a female Sasquatch is menstruating to get away from the clan during her menses or their birthing structures where a midwife might be there helping a pregnant female give birth. But when that male Sasquatch is out doing his thing, hunting, harvesting, scouting, oh, Jesus, tree structure. Wind's going that way. I got to go upwind. And well around that tree teepee structure because I can't be anywhere near that female blood. So it's an anthropological proof that the Indians did it and Sasquatches are human. So they're Indian tribe as well. That's why I call them the other tribe. So if you're a male, don't go stick your body into a tree structure. And if you're a hunter, you're going to ruin your hunting for years. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. Uh, let's go to Simon in Australia. Do Bigfoot wonder why they're like humans or why they're here like humans do? No, I think when it, see that's us in this invert urban environment, we think like an urbanized human. But when you get out there with your bush kit and you live in a bush like a Sasquatch, like I've done, you don't think thoughts like that. You're just there. I am, therefore, I am. I'm living. And you don't think about things that, you know, like that. You know, it's just, and Sasquatch are so, when you're in bush living, uh, hunter gatherer seasonal migrator for food abundance and trying to protect your butt from all the nastiness out there that can pounce on you and eat you and poop you out real quick because everything gets pooped out in the bush you don't have time to think dwell into depth and that's why when you study humans and you look at our path and from hunter gatherers to get used in agriculture to agriculture gave us leisure time and we're able to expand our religion our culture our governance our society structure and sasquatches aren't at that level they're still hunter gatherers so they're not sitting there going i wonder why i exist because of these reasons maybe i have a god and i should believe in the god and maybe i should come up with this whole religious pathway now they don't have no time for that their stomach just growled they gotta go eat Thomas, 14 seconds left. Thank you for an entertaining show tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Very much appreciate every time you come on this show. And 
And it's such a pleasure to chat with you again, my friend. Yeah. And for everyone out there, don't forget Sasquatch Island Facebook group. That's your go-to for everything about Sasquatch. It's my book to teach you and Sasquatch Island YouTube channel to really entertain you. Thomas Seawood, everybody. Coming up next, Among the Missing from Steve Stockton. Then Super Duke on the Cryptid Report. We have it all coming up in hour number three next on Spaced Out Radio. Way to go, my friend. Thanks. Thank you. That was a good one. You got good questions. You're the best, man. I love you, man. You kick ass on Wes Germer. You got good questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yes. you. My friend, so this uh, event in May in Vegas, you hosting yes. it? Yeah, it's an invite to everybody. Like the we we don't do a conference. It's everybody pays their own way. I pay my way. The audience pays their way. All our special guests pay their way, and we all just kind of gather. We do a live radio show, and and we just get together and hang out for a party weekend. The fans, the the guests. If you want to come, join us. Yeah, where do I find it on your website? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to reach out to the local Indian tribe, see if they'll sponsor Peggy and I to go down there to perform for them. And then if you want us, we're going to bring our kit if we do go. If you want us to put a stage performance on, we're available. Can do. Okay. I'll, I'll stay in touch with you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'll send you some emails. Thanks a lot, Dave. That was great. See you, Thomas. Okay, talk to you later. Uh, Bye. Bye. Thomas Seawood, everybody. That was great. Just great. All right, I'm going to quickly step away. I'll be right back, guys. Uh, Varla is not going to be there this time, Preacher. But Coley is. Nicole is going to be there.
All right. Potato Gross, how you doing? You're going to have to fly, Preacher. <laughs> preacher. It is cross-country tours. Dude, you need to... Oh, you might as well start now, man. Ah, love the Preacher. I got to tell you, Eric Markham, the Preacher, is one of my longest uh, listeners... And just one of the most incredible human beings out there. He really is. Love the guy. Dogman, how you doing? Oh, Jesus, that's right. That's right. <laughs> oh, gosh. Start now, preach. Pick up Nicole on the way. Thank you to Ukrainian Anita, Preacher, and Pam H. for the super chats tonight. Very much appreciate the love and support. Want to see you all in Reno for our fan party May 10th through 12th at the Silver Legacy Casino and Resort. Book your hotels now. Well, after the show. Here we go with our three. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Here we go with the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears. Wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America. Digitally on Odyssey Radio, talk stream live at KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. What do you got for us, Clam? Cackle it. Cackle it is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and you can join us on Patreon in the SOR Space Travelers Club. It is that time of the night where we say hello to Steve Stockton from Among the Missing and another great story. Hello, friends. Welcome to Among the Missing YouTube channel on Space Out Radio. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'm about to take you on an unbelievable journey of people just like you. Their stories and encounters will haunt us on Among the Missing. There's a lot of missing and murdered indigenous stories that come off the Navajo Reservation that Route 666, now 491, travels through. A lot. You've heard some of them here on this channel with their Spirited Away series. The following story was told by a father relocating his family to Durango, Colorado. Here's what he has to say. I'd purchased an old U-Haul from a dealer in Gallup, New Mexico, to move my family from there to Durango, Colorado. We left Friday morning and expected to be in Durango around noon Saturday. The trip was pretty uneventful till about 20 miles outside of Shiprock. My daughter, that was riding with me, began to feel sick to her stomach and needed me to pull over. I pulled off the road to let her do her business. She was 12, so I didn't worry too much about letting her out of her own to have some privacy. After some 10 minutes or so, my daughter hadn't returned. Concerned she was sicker than I initially thought, my wife sent me to go look for her. I got out of the truck to go check on her, walking in the direction that I saw her going, calling her name the whole time. I began to feel concerned, though, when she didn't respond, and so I quickened my pace and felt a pall of dread descend over me as I recalled all the stories I'd ever heard over the years about this devil's highway. I've never been one for superstition much and always thought those who told those stories were nervous Nellies or just straight-up liars. In a full-on panic now, though, I raced further down the road, screaming out my daughter's name. 
My terror couldn't have been more absolute when I heard the shrill, ear-splitting scream that only a 12-year-old girl could make come from a ravine just east of where I'd been heading. I suppose it was the adrenaline that kicked in and gave me strength to sprint those last 20 yards. I grabbed my daughter into my arms and raced back to my truck in what felt like mere seconds. Once we were back in the pseudo-safety of the van, I asked my daughter what happened. She said she ran off looking for a quiet place to throw up and she wasn't sure which direction she'd gone or how far she'd traveled before she was overwhelmed by this need to throw up. She was forced to stop until the stomach cramp subsided. Just as she was getting ready to start back to the van, she saw a young Indian girl running towards her, not much older than herself, running towards her and calling out a woman. The girl said, Spirits cry, not for thee. Leave this place or die like me. This is when she said she screamed. I showed up, grabbed her, and ran off. I told my daughter and the rest of the family to lock the doors behind me, keep them locked. I want to go look for this young native girl. My daughter, in what seemed to be a state of shock, shot out her hand on my arm, looked me in the eye, and said, Don't go, Daddy. It's too late. Feeling very frightened now by the look and demeanor of my daughter, I said, What do you mean it's too late? There's a little girl out there who needs our help, and I'm going to go find her. I'll never forget that feeling of spiritual vertigo and lament at the loss of my daughter's innocence as she calmly replied, Didn't you see her, Daddy? Didn't you see that she was holding her own head in her arms? I told you, Daddy. It's too late. Now, you don't have to believe my story. Hell, I wouldn't. But please do me this one favor. Take the 40 to the 20. Or take the 70 and come down from the north. But please, for the love of God, Stay off Route 666. Now, these are just a few of the stories associated with the infamous Devil's Highway, Route 666. History has seen many changes to the area. The highway's five lanes now, and the road crews continue to make improvements. When the number of the highway was changed to 491, it seemed to take the negative air that surrounded the roadway with it, for the most part. Sightings of UFOs, ghostly girls, monsters, skinwalkers, Hellish big rig trucks and flaming children have slowed. But there's still plenty of history and stories, new and old, lore and tales, sightings and disappearances. The Devil's Highway will never escape its legendary mysterious past. This could simply be true due to the higher than normal accidents and fatalities that happened along this road. But if you do find yourself along 491, the former Highway 666, the Devil's Highway, be wary of the things that go speeding down the highway past you. Or for people asking for a ride, it might just be the last time you're seen alive. Oh, that's just creepy. Absolutely creepy. Thank you, Steve Stockton, for another great creepy story on Among the Missing to kick off hour three of tonight's show as you do each and every Monday through Friday night. If you want more stories like that, just head on over to youtube.com forward slash Among the Missing and hit subscribe. From the missing to the mysterious mountains of Montana, you know what it's time for. Here comes Super Duke. Yes, the man, the myth, and the legend. Super Duke, all rolled into one. How you doing, buddy? Hey, bud. Good to be here for the weekly visit with you and all of your wonderful followers and listeners. Well, we should have uh, an exciting little piece of news that if you miss this segment live, you can always go over to Super Duke's YouTube channel. Sorry, it's this way. Super Duke's <laughs> Super Duke's YouTube channel and catch this segment again on his channel. And, and thank you, Duke, for the collaboration uh, on uh, putting Spaced Out Radio on World Bigfoot Radio as well. That when you came up with that idea, it was so weird and, and so synchronistic because I was thinking about that. And I love the idea. And I appreciate you, you approaching and saying, hey, dude, let's do this. Well, yeah, why not? I can use more content for my channel. I'm only on once a week, and it's not like this is throwaway content. All, all the viewers on my channel are missing it. I actually prep for these shows 
and try and find really good stuff and, you know, interesting news bits and old reports and stuff like that to talk about, none of which is on my channel. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a it's a win-win. Uh, they find out that the show is going on over here. The late nighters maybe start showing up for it. And in the meantime, you probably get some subs out of it. So, you know, everybody collaborate. Everybody wins. Everybody wins. Everybody wins. It. Yeah, and that's going on with me this week. I had uh, gigantic Bigfoot Clearinghouse Channel NVTV, which just put out a video every day. It's either like whatever is the newest thing, they'll put out a video on it. Uh, or something that might not be so new that somebody's taking another closer look at, they put a video out on it. Or like something from five years ago and there's nothing new and they'll just put that out because everybody forgot about it. And they put that out. So they got a video like every day. And they finally figured out if they provide attribution that the people they stole the video from won't show up and yell at them and give them copyright strikes, which is going on for years. So, so when they put mine up, somebody uh, went, hey, Duke, they shared your video. And I went and looked at it and right away at the beginning of the screen. Oh, this video is from Duke at World Bigfoot Radio. And I'm like, OK, but good. Go ahead and have fun. And they've, they used a lot of stuff from Blaine. And I remember Blaine, uh, Blaine got really bent out of shape one time because they showed the whole damn video where he's got all of this really cool video. But it's like, unless you're a Bigfoot expert, you're not going to be able to pick out the Bigfoot in the background. And in the end of the video where he picks them all out and shows them off, they cut that part of the video out. Oh, no. So he got really bent out of shape. And uh, apparently at some point they used some picture of his for a thumbnail and Kelly Shaw from Rocky Mountain Sasquatch was trying to find a suitable thumbnail, and he thought it was something that they had rights to. So he used it, and Blaine showed up going, what the hell are you doing play, using my uh, picture without giving me any credit? And Kelly's all like, I didn't know it was your picture, man. <laughs> you know? So this, this kind of stuff happens a lot. It's uh, fairly hilarious. But you know, the ones that do yeah. it on purpose, that's a different story, where they steal somebody else's stuff and then claim it's theirs. You naughty, know what? Naughty. I'm having that trouble on uh, Rumble. Mm -hmm. And once we get a few things going, there is a Russian channel out there that is actually taking my content nightly and capitalizing on it. And so I have. Well, what to, do they wait? Are they dubbing it in Russian or something? Because how many no, Russians? They're, they're, they're playing it in English. <laughs> okay. They're playing it in English. And, and it, it, there's a couple Russian channels on, on Rumble that if you uh, type in spaced out radio, you'll actually find them. Which is kind of neat, but I mean, I right now it's like okay, use the promotion, but you know what? They're making money off of me, and and I don't have a Rumble channel, so. Oh well, if you saw the vast amounts that could be made on Rumble, you wouldn't be griping nearly as much, because <laughs> it's like nothing. Unless you're getting a million views, you're not going to get anything from them. Well, put it this way: I know the channel has uh, a lot more subscribers on it than than my own personal YouTube channel for Spaced Out Radio. So. <laughs> awesome. They'll show, they'll yeah. find a YouTube one. They'll come over and sub over here. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, hey, at least share the subs, you know, before I shut down your channel. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to, you know what? It, it's really sad that, you know, there are people out there that will actually go and make money off of your content and and try and fool the world on it, you know? So it's kind of interesting. Yep, there was uh, another example of that. Is uh, this kept coming? It comes around every so often, but the last time was on uh, Sasquatch Minnesota Breakdown. I can't remember exactly what the name of the channel was, but somebody had sent it to him saying that they had recorded it locally and they got a, a series of Bigfoot hauls. And they were legit a part, uh, on the part of, yeah, those were actually Bigfoot hauls. In fact, there's three Bigfoot making noises. But it was not local. They had actually stolen it from a field researcher in Louisiana and claimed it was theirs. And I know the guy they stole it from. Oh, no way. This stuff happens pretty frequently. Yeah, it does. Yes, it does. Super Duke, we got 10 minutes to go until we get to the bottom of the hour. What do you got for us tonight? Well, first two brief and now three brief announcements. One, uh, Iron Dogger, who's probably still in the chat room, is going to be on my show this weekend talking about Bigfoot up in Alaska. And the one trackway that she found when it was 26 below and she was out snowmobiling. Wow. <laughs> Pretty cold to be walking around barefoot, huh? And then, uh, of course, she was uh, the, she got her name from the Iron Dog Sled Race, 
which at the time she ran it was 2,000 miles. That's a lot of snowmobiling. And her and her partner, Misty, were the first uh, female team ever in history to complete the race. And since then, now in this age of smash the patriarchy and girl power, there's only been one other female team that have completed the race in the 20 years since then. So she is a very tough lady. And uh, she's got some really interesting stories to listen to. She's got some orb video. And she was also recently investigating the stone giant's door in the side of the mountain in Oregon, which is really close to where she's at. <laughs> So we're going to have that in there, too. So all you guys that are all fascinated by the the stone giant door that you've been seeing going viral all over TikTok, uh, come on over to my channel this Sunday for some updates on that. And also, there was recently a picture released of a car wreck on Interstate 35 in North Texas, I think it was. It's somewhere in Texas. Uh, there's a whole, you know, multiple lanes of traffic. The cars are all snarled up, piled up. And over on the right-hand side where the big barrier on the side of the road is, there's this humanoid-looking monster that just stepped over it, beaten butt into the woods. Guess what caused the car wreck? <laughs> and at least one person got a pretty good picture of it. And we've looked at it quite, uh, quite a bit and passed it around to the experts. And this is one of the few times where we're completely stumped. We do not know what the hell this thing is. It's not a Bigfoot. But it uh, apparently caused a car wreck, so not not a good critter. And then for the last thing, of course, coming up here in a couple of days, we've got uh, Thanksgiving here in the 50 weird states. So happy Thanksgiving to everybody out there. And remember, Thanksgiving symbolizes being together and not fighting with each other and having a peaceful day and eating until you're so full you can't fight. And also try and remember that uh, during some of these holidays, there are people that have very little to nothing or perhaps they don't have any family and they're spending a holiday alone and try and help those people out too and give them a Thanksgiving. Absolutely. So like now that I'm done being all maudlin and sappy, um, here's some really cool Bigfoot reports. And we're back to David Weatherly's Monsters of Big Sky Country book again, all the way up to page 62. And we are going into the mid 1970s. Now, if you guys remember from the last show, we had that sheriff here that got so many reports in his area. When he retired, he became a Bigfoot researcher and actually turned out a book on it because it was just like, what the heck is going on around here? And, he, you know, him and all of his deputies and everything were investigating the reports and they came in instead of laughing, which is how he got started on in the first place. So this is after that section in the book. And we're going to start out with Mrs. Presley Lay and her son along with his wife and children, saw a creature in the fall of 1974. The group were near the Bitterroot River. Hey, I'm about three miles from that. When they spotted the Bigfoot about 200 yards from their position, the creature was covered in brown hair, walked upright, and swung its arms in an exaggerated fashion as it moved quickly from one side of the clearing to the opposite side. The account was then sent to uh, famed Canadian researcher John Green. Cascade County Sheriff's Office received a report on December 26, 1975 from a pair of frightened junior high school girls. The first girl, a resident of Great Falls, was spending the Christmas holiday with a second girl who lived on a horse property outside of Vaughn. Late in the afternoon, the girls noticed the horses were in an agitated state, stamping the ground, rearing up on their hind legs, and acting otherwise erratically. The girls quickly discovered the source of the horse's agitation. A figure about seven and a half feet tall was about 200 yards away from the property's mobile home, about 25 yards away from a thicket. As recounted in Mystery Stalks the Prairie, quote, the Great Falls girl found a 22 rifle belonging to her friend's father and looked through the scope of the creature. She described its face as dark and awful looking and not like a human's. The girl said the creature was seven to seven and a half feet tall and twice as wide as a man. Hoping to frighten the creature away, the girl fired the rifle into the air, but the hairy thing didn't react. She waited a short time, then fired again. Although the girl had not fired toward it, it seemed to behave as if it had been shot at or even shot. In a bizarre display, the thing fell to the ground and started to pull itself along with its arms as if injured. After covering a short distance, it stood back up. The two girls had seen enough. They turned on their heels and retreated from the area. When they looked back to see what the creature was doing, they spotted three or four other creatures helping the first biped get into the cover of some bushes. And I'm sorry if I read this last week. I don't remember if I got to this one or not. 
Captain Wolverton was impressed by the report and the obvious fright displayed by the girls served to reinforce that they were not lying or trying to pull a prank. The girl also volunteered to take a polygraph test and both of them passed it. The night after the incident, Captain Wolverton under Sheriff Glenn Osborne and Deputy Dick Gazwoda went to the area of the sighting and conducted their own search for the creatures. Wolverton used a starlight scope to scan the area and the other men went into the brush to try to flush out anything lurking out of sight. While the officers didn't spot any Bigfoot in the area, they did find a number of tree breaks that were unusual and similar to those found at other reported sighting locations. The officers also spoke with the Vaughn girl's father, who related his own tale. The man told the lawmen that shortly after midnight on Christmas morning, he was awakened by a sound he described as, quote, like a human dying an agonizing death, unquote. The man took a flashlight and went outside to investigate. While a witness acted bravely... <clears throat> excuse me uh he his dog did not and refused to go outside apparently he either failed to find anything or retreated back inside whatever the case wolverton doesn't note any further information about the incident the captain himself returned to the property again the following day and walked around the area hoping to find footprints but discovered nothing the unsettling sound heard by the Vaughn witness was also reported by other people in the area the following month, a man living just a few miles west of the property reported the same disturbing sound. Just like the Vaughn girl's father, the man noticed that his dogs, who were normally aggressive, were acting afraid, standing up against the house and making very faint barking noises. Now, echoing the Vaughn man's report, the witness also said the scream was like that of a man dying in pain. The noise lasted about five minutes. In February 1976, a resident of Bab called the sheriff's department to report that she and her husband had heard the weird sound the previous summer. While it's unclear why the woman waited so long to report the sounds, it's notable that the pattern was the same, a miserable moaning echoing in the night, and dogs had acted terrified. According to Mystery Stalks the Prairie, she said other residents of Bab had heard the sound too, and she understood a man from Browning had actually seen Bigfoot on Logan Pass in Glacier Park the preceding summer. Authorities did not have the man's name, so they could not check this story. Now, on February 11, 1976, Captain Wolverton received a report from an airman who said he had found bipedal tracks near Beaver Creek in the Rocky Mountains. According to the airman, the creature that left the tracks had three toes. Heavy snowfall prevented Wolverton from investigating the scene closely, but he did fly over the area hoping to see something from the air. He reported, however, nothing unusual. Not long after the two girls had their weird encounter, a pair of boys in Ulm, a few miles southwest of Great Falls, had a sighting. It was February 21st, 1976, and the boys were near a bridge that crossed over the Missouri River. One of the young men saw a hair-covered arm reaching out from some bushes. The second boy, who was further ahead on the trail, saw a tall creature with dark brown hair and, quote, glowing whitish-yellow eyes, unquote. The boys reported the incident to the sheriff's department, but it was more than two weeks after the sighting, so officers felt it was pointless to investigate. The boys were given polygraph tests, and both passed. Something must have stirred the creature up that week, because the following morning, East Helena resident Leonard Hegel was traveling on Interstate 15 south of Great Falls International Airport when he spotted a large bipedal creature moving across a field around a quarter of a mile from the highway. Hegel stopped the car and got out with his 357 Magnum in hand. He ran into the field to pursue the creature and got within about 700 feet of it, but when it turned and faced him, he decided to retreat back to his vehicle. Hegel told Cascade County Sheriff's officers that the hairy thing was about seven feet tall with three foot wide shoulders. His wife and children were with him at the time of the sighting. Also in February 1976, a young man named Leonard Semgard had a fright when he was on his way home from school one afternoon. The 13-year-old boy usually walked through a field on his route, but on this particular day, the field was occupied by an eight-foot-tall creature covered in dark hair. The boy rushed to a phone booth and called his grandmother to come retrieve him. The following month, on March 7, a woman phoned and spoke with a deputy sheriff to report a creature sighting. She said the thing was crossing a road on the highway north of Vaughn when she spotted it. It was reddish brown and hairy. The woman said the beast was standing in a ditch with one arm forward, and she had the impression it was about to cross the road. Super Duke on World Bigfoot Radio, right here for the Cryptid Report. We will continue 
with these great report stories from Super Duke right after this on Spaced Out Radio. Stay tuned. Final half hour is next. Yeah, and I agree with that assessment. When you've got that many encounters happening that fast, one right after the other in a small area, there's something going on. Because <laughs> they're couple usually way better at hiding. A couple questions from DB Nobody here. Do you think Bigfoot has anything to do with the missing 411 phenomena? Uh, yes, but not nearly as much as some people like to say. And, and Dave, Dave Pilates is heading toward the UFO thing too, by the way. Oh, yeah. And what's the also, connection? They abduct uh, Bigfoot just like they abduct humans. I wish I could say something right now. I can't. Yeah. Well, you can ask Robin about that. She'll tell you the same thing. I I'm know. I'll go have a couple of drags off my sig before yeah, I have to go back on here. There you go. You go. Thanks for that question, DB. No problem, buddies. <clears throat> Super Duke. Don't you have to exit your chair to go for your smoke? Yeah, I, I have to like. Mm. All right. I'm pumped up for Reno. Pumped up. <clears throat> Sovereign Farts just walks through the forest ripping hard. He rips hard ass right there. Mm hmm Oob Joe's main. You've got Bigfoot. How's Lola tonight? That gorgeous Lola. Good morning, Stephen Finnegan. How are you? Okay. Any big fans of Expedition Bigfoot out there? You better enjoy that show while it's on. And I got contacted by uh, somebody who's trying to find a cast to make another Hollywood show to replace it. So I don't think it's going to be on more than another season. Hmm. That's sad. <sighs> Maybe they'll get a better show. I mean, look, they had Finding Bigfoot on for 10 years, and they couldn't find Bigfoot in 10 years, not even one. That's not very entertaining. Well, come on. Give him a break. <laughs> After 10 years? No, we did it in one try. They don't get, they don't get anything from me but ridicule. <laughs> Come on. Not finding Bigfoot? Yeah, never finding Bigfoot, as we like to call them. Yep. And somebody in a chat room earlier was saying, yeah, I, you know, I had sent them a bunch of stuff, and they were looking at it, and they were getting set to maybe do a whole season on urban Bigfoot. And then they got, you know, canceled. And I went, well, after 10 years of not being able to find them in the woods, you might as well give the urban area a shot. <laughs> Dave, it's not that hard. You found them in one year. Oh, I know. Season one of Dave Goes Looking for Bigfoot. Success. <laughs> Big go. Yeah, Derek. Yeah. he had, Well, he was ill for a while, too. 
I'm glad to see he's still around. He's the he's the one on their cast that I actually like because you know he's been doing it for a long time. He used to be on shows with Autumn Williams years ago. We got thirty seconds. Bad Daddy, exactly. You can't find Bigfoot. You've got to get Bigfoot to find you. Fifteen seconds. Thank you to Preacher, Anita, and Pam H for the super chats. Very much appreciate the love and support. And we're gonna get going here momentarily. <laughs> Brown D, yes. <laughs> Here we go with the final half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you miss most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and you can join us on Patreon in the SOR Space Travelers Club. We continue on with Super Duke of World Bigfoot Radio, and we are hanging on out. It is story time here with some incredible encounters. Super Duke, welcome back. Hey, I'm back. <laughs> And happy upcoming Thanksgiving again, everyone. And you already heard the message, so I'm not going to give it again. But keep that uh, blissful, peaceful feeling in your heart. And be very careful of large gathering areas because some bad people might be planning on doing something. So stay away from them. Meanwhile, back to the reports. Hold on, hold on a second. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. We're, I'm pulling the reins in here. You're not telling people to not go shopping at black friday are you mm, i doubt any of those would be good targets of opportunity i would say like you know big sport gatherings and big concerts and stuff would be what you'd want to avoid all right because because duke i draw the line if, if this interview would have been over if you were saying to our great american public not to be heading to the stores on black friday and beating the living tar out of each other okay i need that i need that the yep. world's watching america well so does the jerry springer crowd that don't have a show to watch anymore and that's the ones that are doing it so anyway back to the bigfoot reports <laughs> later that month a teenager said he saw a hairy creature standing in the middle of dempsey road in great falls great falls north of me the boy was riding his bike around nine o'clock at night the creature ran through a hedge in the yard of a house and vanished like many other witnesses of the period the boy was given a polygraph test and passed. And at this point, I'm going to break in and give a Bigfoot report that isn't in the book. One of the people that was one of my team members for about five years was driving from Great Falls to Missoula and saw a Bigfoot standing on an open road adjacent to the freeway watching the cars. And only because he turned his head at the right second as they zoomed past it, did he see there was this massive humanoid figure filling up most of this one lane road going off into the trees, standing there watching cars. So then he contacted me. And after this, it, you know, <clears throat> he became one of my, you know, my best research assistants, found tons of track structures, blah, 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 you name it. But that was how he got started. He's just driving down the road, <laughs> going to visit mom down in Missoula, looks to his side oh my god what what is that yeah well it looks like about a nine foot sasquatch standing in the middle of this little road <laughs> watching the traffic go by on the freeway adjacent to it so this is like fairly regular around here most of this stuff just doesn't get reported i mean he never filed a report on it so later that month the teenager said he saw i okay we got that one blah 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 or did we uh dempsey road in great falls the boy was riding his bike around nine o'clock at night. Creature ran through a hedge in the yard of a house and vanished. Like many other witnesses of the period, the boy was given a polygraph test and passed it. 
The following month, another young man spotted a tall, hairy creature near his home in Helena, and Helena is the capital of Montana, so it's a good-sized town. According to Captain Wilberton and Deputy Ken Anderson, who investigated the case, the boy woke up around 4.30 a.m. on April 4th because he was restless. He stood in his room looking out his second-story window where he had a good view of the pasture to the east of his home. At around 5 a.m., the boy spotted a, quote, tall, hairy creature walking in the pasture coming from south or the right. The boy estimated the creature at about eight feet in height and told the officers it moved with long strides while its arms went back and forth like a human's would. The boy provided the officers further details of the thing's appearance. According to their report, quote, creature did not appear to have a neck, but it was capable of turning its head and appeared to be looking around. Except for its face, it was covered entirely with brown or black hair, about an inch to inch and a half long. The boy could not describe the creature's face, but said the nose appeared, quote, pushed in, unquote. He also reported that the thing's forehead protruded out, then upward to a rounded head. The witness said the creature's movement was very smooth and it did not appear to bend its knees very much as it walked. The creature's arms were thick and there was no visible curve in the small of the thing's back. As the boy watched the hairy beast, it moved directly east of the house where it was joined by another smaller creature. The witness reported the second creature was the same color as the first, but about a head shorter. Oddly, the larger creature reached down and picked up a dark colored object about the size of a bale of hay with something flapping on ends that looked similar to a piece of dark plastic. As the boy observed, the larger creature passed the item over to the smaller figure, then they continued toward the house. The creature came to within about 100 feet of the boy's home, at which point it appeared to look directly toward the young man's window. The frightened boy rushed downstairs and reported the incident to his father. By the time the boy managed to get his father to the window, the creatures had disappeared. The following day, the young man's sister found a track in the pasture, and she and her brother covered it with wood until the next day when they made a plaster cast of it. Officers Wolverton and Anderson were impressed by the young man's testimony and noted that the boy was upset over being misquoted in the newspaper where it was reported that he had claimed the initial creature was 10 feet tall. The boy drew sketches of what he saw and gave them to the officers. The officers made their own cast of the track find and discovered that it was three-toed, 17 and a half inches long, and seven inches wide. Apparently, the property was quite a hot spot for Bigfoot activity. While speaking with the boy's father, deputies learned about another incident 12 days prior to the boy's sighting. The boy's father reported that he had been taking a bath when he heard noises outside the bathroom window. He got dressed and went outside to investigate, and he discovered a large footprint in the snow outside the window. He reported that there were also other scratch marks on either side of the print. Wilberton and Anderson soon found that the whole family had stories to share. The boy's mother reported that a range of strange things had been occurring around the property. She reported hearing what sounded like heavy running outside the house, and she told officers that the family dogs had been acting frightened. Additionally, the family was hearing weird sounds they described as something between an elk bugling and dogs howling. Even more bizarre is a note regarding other tracks in the area, as reported in Mystery Stalks the Prairie. <clears throat> Quote, as officers searched the pasture area where the two creatures were seen, they noticed both cattle tracks and horse prints. When they asked the boy's father where the horses were taken out to pasture, he replied, there's never been horses in that pasture. Three-toed creatures, phantom horses, what exactly was taking place at this property? As far as the sheriff's office was concerned, the reports were valid, though unexplained. Wilberton's official report stated, quote, after talking to the boy and his family, I believe the boy did see what he reported. Another incident reported to me by a correspondent details a July 1976 sighting. A woman and her daughter watched a hairy creature for half an hour in Phelan Gulch. The woman had driven up a remote logging road, and they were out picking berries when the daughter noticed a biped, uh, biped several hundred yards away. She described the creature as about eight feet tall, with straw-colored hair on its head and shoulders, and darker brown hair on the rest of its body. Yeah, that must be nice camo. The thing was clearly watching the woman, and as it did, it moved its head from side to side. As the woman observed, the creature's head movement stopped, and it stood still. Finally, it sat down, keeping its attention on the two women. 
The daughter was curious and wanted to get a better look, so she started walking towards the Bigfoot. She didn't get far before she lost her nerve and backtracked. The women got back in the car and left the area. Now, the Great Falls Tribune mentioned another incident that occurred in July 76, five miles from Great Falls. A female motorist traveling at 5.30 a.m. on I-15 saw a hairy biped standing near the Great Knoll on the freeway, about 20 feet away. The creature was between 7 and 8 feet in height and covered in dark brown or black hair. The woman was shocked by the sight and stopped her vehicle as she watched the creature walk away to the west. Curiously, the same day, a 7.9 earthquake struck central Montana. Was the creature on the move that day because of the earthquake? Some researchers have noted a correlation between earthquake activity and Bigfoot sightings. Perhaps like other animals, they're sensitive to the pending earthquake about to happen. A report from July 21st, 1976 came from four men who said they saw a pair of bipedal hairy creatures walking along a hill toward the Rainbow Dam. The brief incident was noted in the Great Falls Tribune in its July 31st edition. This vague report was one of many in 1976, a very busy year for Montana's mystery creatures. In October, Gail Cupti of the Vaughn area had a sighting of an eight-foot-tall beast that appeared to be raiding her chicken coop. <laughs> and boy, if you want to hear lots of reports of Bigfoot raiding chicken coops, just go anywhere down south. There's tons of them. Capti and her son had found the gate of a sheep pen open during the day and 18-inch prints around the pen. The prints were human-like, but had only four toes. Grain had also disappeared from one of Capti's storage bins, so it was clear that something was treating the Capti farm like a buffet. The woman was alerted by her dog barking that night, which led to her seeing the creature. She described it as, quote, tall, tan, and ape-like with very long arms, unquote. When the creature realized Capti was watching it, it ran away at high speed. Uh, OregonBigfoot.com website mentions a September 76 sighting from Silver Bow, Silver Bow County involving yet another group of Boy Scouts. In this case, some scouts on a bus spotted a tall, hairy creature running behind some bushes before it vanished into a logging area. The creature also reportedly had a horrible smell. The sighting took place near Brown's Gulch Boy Scout Camp in Butte. Another account sent to me reports that an unidentified game guide and two clients hunting in the Tobacco Root Mountains. Man, there's such interesting mountain uh, names here. <laughs> tobacco Root Mountains in October 1976 reportedly saw a pair of Bigfoot that stood eight to nine feet tall. The creatures were in a clearing about 100 yards from the men. Both creatures were coal black in color, but one had a white streak on its back. In the book Sasquatch the Apes Among Us by John Green, he includes a brief note about the three men near Gerber in Cascade County who spotted a Bigfoot in April 77. The creature was six and a half feet tall and covered in thick black hair that was about four inches long. The men decided to chase the creature. It initially ran, but then turned to face the men. Purportedly, the men stood their ground and drove the creature off. The Anomaly Research Bulletin, issue number eight, reported that a pair of campers saw three Bigfoot near Silver City, Lewis, and Clark County in June 1977. The creatures were a staggering 10 feet tall. A BFRO entry reports that a man out doing some night fishing in August 77 ended up sharing some of his catch with a Sasquatch, but it wasn't by choice. The man was fly fishing along the Missouri River near Hauser Dam in Lewis and Clark County. He used some rocks and formed a small circular pool near the water's edge to hold the fish he caught. It was after 11 o'clock and very dark, so the man placed a light on a boulder and continued fishing about 20 yards upstream of the light. He realized he had lost the fly off his line and headed back to the light to get a new one. As he approached the boulder, he noticed movement around the area and used his light to get a look at what, was, what he was dealing with. And he received quite a surprise. Quote, I was starting to hear a crackling sound and see movement from the brush. I pointed the beam directly at the movement, only 10 feet from me, and got a full view of a hairy bipedal creature moving very rapidly up the bank and quartering away from me in the downstream direction. It was very large and muscular, with long dark hair and seemingly no neck. Estimated height, seven to eight feet, guessing four or 500 pounds. I could not see its face as it was moving away from me. It took long, powerful strides, and its arms were moved powerfully as a man would move walking very rapidly. 
It was amazing to see how quickly it traversed over the boulders and up the steep embankment. I had the creature in the lamp beam for only a few seconds before it disappeared into the darkness. When the shocked fisherman turned to check on his catch, he received another surprise. Before the sighting of the creature, I had four trout ranging from two to three pounds in that pool, and after the sighting, there were only two trout. The creature must have been foraging along the river's edge and found an easy meal. Note that it left him to. <clears throat> the man took the remaining fish in his gear and headed out of the area. Sasquatch the Apes Among Us mentions a report from the same year, August 20, Staff Sergeant Fred Wilson of Malmstrom Air Force Base reported, and this is my favorite sighting from Montana, that he and a group of boys had been taken out into a, a wilderness spot uh, camping and spotted a Bigfoot. Wilson said the group spotted a, quote, 15-foot creature on a ridge in Belt Creek Canyon. The incident occurred at 2 in the morning. Heavy rain had moved into the area, leading the group to break camp. They were on their way to their vehicles when they heard noises that attracted their attention. By a flashlight beam, they saw a very large, hairy creature standing near a clump of bushes. According to Wilson, the thing was, quote, covered with long hair, having no neck, and standing on two legs. It was Wilson who estimated the extremely large height of 15 feet. One member of the party grabbed a shotgun and fired two shots in the creature's direction as it started running toward them. They made it into their cars and fled the scene. Wilson later took a polygraph test and passed. Uh, the guys, they don't include it in here, but his eyewitness statement on what it looked like is, he said it looked like a Mack truck coming at them. It was 15 feet tall. It was taking 40-foot strides, and it scared the living hell out of them. They barely could stay in front of it. It got caught up to the vehicle and buffeted it a couple times before they got going fast enough to put distance between them. So it was apparently not happy. No kidding. Uh, around the same time, but farther west on the outskirts of Missoula, Missoula. Oh, yeah, that's where I live. A young girl out horseback riding had a daytime encounter with a Bigfoot. The girl was riding in a wooded area bordering the Rattlesnake Wilderness. It was a peaceful summer ride until both the girl and her horse were startled by something unusual. As she recalls, quote, My horse stopped dead in its tracks and we rode through a meadow. There I was, face to face with a Bigfoot that was about 10 feet away from me. It was peeking out from behind a tree. It just stood there looking at me and didn't make a sound. I slowly turned my horse around and ran home. It must have stood at least seven feet or more taller than myself. That was the only time I've ever witnessed one. The woman reported her sighting years later, 1997, to the BFRO. She has a note in the 97 statement that indicates activity still continuing in the region. She says, as of today, my husband and myself built a home on the Clark Fork River on the outskirts of Missoula. Hey, that's where I live. And over the last two summers, we heard an odd sort of scream that sounds almost like a prehistoric bird, really gravelly, and it travels very fast, covering a lot of ground. This sound only happened in the summertime, usually right before daybreak or right after midnight. And the neighbors have also heard it, but no one can figure it out. It kind of sends chills down your spine, and all the neighbor dogs start to bark, like in your tape recordings. The witness was indicating recordings of purported Bigfoot sounds. The witness also added that her grandparents had spotted a Bigfoot 30 years previously. The couple saw the creature running through a river bottom near their home in the Swamp Valley. They said it looked like a hairy man loping through the brush on the river bottom that ran in front of their home. Apparently, Boy Scouts in Montana have a high probability of encountering a Sasquatch because yet another troop of Scouts spotted one in July 1978 in Lewis and Clark County. According to the brief report given to me, a jamboree was being held near the town of Helena, and two young scouts spotted one of the creatures at the edge of the river. The beast was described as gorilla-like and about six feet tall. The two boys observed the creature picking leaves off a bush and eating them. After a few moments, the Bigfoot walked into the trees and disappeared. Unfortunately, no further details were provided, nor was the original source of the account reported to me. A hunting trip in the fall of 1978... I mean, my God, we're barely making any progress through the 70s here, Dave. You realize how many freaking <laughs> reports are in? My God. Reports. Jesus. Yeah, this place is just overrun with Bigfoot. Please come take some. A hunting trip in the fall of 1978 resulted in a Bigfoot sighting in Madison County near Virginia City. 
The witness recalled the sighting in a BFRO report and says he and his cousin, along with his father and uncle, were out for an early morning hunt on October 21st, the opening day of deer season. The reported witness and his cousin were riding in the back of a pickup truck as the group made its way up Alder Gulch. The pair was scanning the area looking for deer. On their right was a hillside meadow covered with thigh-high sagebrush. They spotted what they first thought was another hunter, but quickly realized the figure was in all black, something a hunter would never do. Looking at the figure, they realized it was an animal of some sort, and they knew what they were observing. As the witness recounts, make no bones about it. The animal had the distinctive dome-shaped head with no neck, broad shoulders, and was solid black. The animal was facing us and slightly bent forward and looked as if it was resting its right arm on its right knee. It occurred to me that he or she knew it got caught out in the open and it was just going to sit there motionless and hope we would drive right by. The closest tree line was about 50 yards away from the Bigfoot and it had taken us only about 15 seconds to get back to where we could see the sagebrush meadow again. <clears throat> the witness later stated that the figure had, quote, no neck. And both men recall the incident to this day. The witness added, quote, I have hunted most of my life and have seen most animals that live in these woods. My cousin has been hunting all his life and knows every animal that is in the woods as well. We'll never forget that morning, and we talk about it with each other occasionally. Kalispell, yet another town in Montana's newspaper, the Weekly News, reported an incident in June 1979 involving two men who told Whitefish police that they had found tracks in a stream bed. A group of officials, including a game warden, a forest ranger, and a police officer, went out to investigate the report. Now, how different is that from some other states? You give them a report, and they laugh at you and tell you to go away. Here they send out a friggin', you know, team. Go investigate. It's probably legit. We get Bigfoot reports all the time. They're all over here. The men found three clear prints on a sandbar, several others on a gravel bank, and more in a nearby pasture. The tracks were 17 inches in length, 9 inches wide, and showed a stride of almost five feet. The game warden estimated the creature was in the neighborhood of 700 pounds. Oh. Pla <laughs> yeah, and that's probably a light guesstimate. A plaster cast was made and sent to a scientist at the University of Montana. In the winter of 79, a motorist on Highway 200 saw a light-colored Sasquatch. Are we running out of time? We've run out of time. Yeah, run out of it. Well, we ran out of 70s reports, too, so 1980s next time. Super Duke, thank you. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brothers watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Space Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at work, at home, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAP, Facebook, Spreaker, LinkedIn, Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter, hashtag Space Out Radio. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Space Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us because together, my friends. We own the night, Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. If you want to bring a friend, we got room for them, too. Good night. Forgot how to breathe there for a second. Oh, yeah, I was starting to get really harsh out throat while I was doing all that reading. But hey, what a big footy night you had here on SOR tonight. This is a fun show. It was interesting. I thought, uh, <coughs> excuse me. I thought Thomas was a lot more 
controlled than he's ever been. Pretty much what I saw, too. Yeah, he kind of tends to get bent out of shape pretty easily and go off on tangents that you shouldn't say publicly and things like that. Yeah. Got him once. Had to calm him down. Yep. Yeah. Got a little political, but... He is he is an investigator, and you know, keeping in mind that a lot of the stuff that he puts out is through the lens of his tribal knowledge, and that's mm-hmm. one of the problems you get with Native American researchers because everything is through the lens of what their tribe says. And you know, he's been in contact with guys from other tribes, and you know, like he mentioned being over in Nebraska with uh the red squatching guys and the Sitanga that they have over there, which isn't the same as the pack West Sasquatch, but those guys don't see eye to eye at all. So, you know, <laughs> just because he says it's a certain way, that's that tribe's opinion or maybe his own. The beautiful part about it is there's still not answers. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of answers. There just makes more questions every time you get some of them. I hear you, man. I we, hear you. We find out basic information and stuff, you know, and the the best way to get information on any subject is to ask the subject. And everybody seems to not think of that. We know that they're like people, right? They've got language. We've known that since the 70s with the Sierra Sounds. They've got a language. You can learn to speak it. <laughs> All you need to do is find one friendly enough that it wants to teach you some some of its language or way easier. And as Thomas would point out, they all know the local languages we're speaking. They understand English and stuff. They might not be able to answer you back, but they'll understand what you're saying. And in most cases, yeah, they do still remember the local, whatever the native tongue is in that area. As long as there's any other natives are still around there, they probably still remember that too. Oh, Probably. I mean, there's some areas where the native population has been wiped out 100 years ago. There's none of them around anymore. And I doubt the Sasquatch in that area still remember the native tribal tongue. They all know English, though, because that's what everybody's speaking. And uh, we were just doing some a uh, little bit of a dig on uh, uh, Ron Moorhead Sierra Sounds the other day. And I had a specific question about a specific part of it that I asked to one of my friends who actually is in communication with them, like talks to them. They come and hang out in the yard. Some of them have pretty passable English skills too. They can say a whole sentence and it's oftentimes not anything like what you would expect they would say, but frequently hilarious. And uh, I asked him about the one segment in there where, and we played it for him, where there's one, a big alpha who is making these single words. What? stuff like that yes and ron is trying to copy him and now that we're off the air i can actually say this part go back and listen to the video if you ever heard uh somebody who's like partially deaf or completely deaf try and pronounce english that's what bigfoot sound like when they try and pronounce english because they don't have an english teacher they're hearing somebody shout it off in the distance and they're listening they're trying to duplicate it. And they're pretty good at mimicry, but not 100% all the time. Like we know one that knows what the word doctor is, but he can't say doctor. He says docker. So they don't always pronounce everything 100% perfect. So while this big male is making these sounds and Ron is mimicking back, he decides to make a sound he's heard humans make before and see if Ron mimics them back. And Ron didn't mimic them back. But if you go listen to it, what it sounds like is he says, what the fuck? What does that sound like in English? Yep. And that's exactly what it was, too, according to the Sasquatch down there. He was fucking with Ron. <laughs> I never even noticed that, dude. Yeah, go back and listen to it. What the fuck? <laughs> and then Ron doesn't say anything. <laughs> oh, God, I didn't even notice that, man. <laughs> I caught it after about the fourth time through and I went, that's freaking English because that's what they sound like when they try and speak, you know, in English because they're not always necessarily like right next to you hearing it perfectly over and over so they can duplicate the word. It comes out a little bit messed up. And he probably heard campers out there, you know, like, hey, somebody took my beer. What the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, 
Oh gosh, that's awesome. So, yeah, if you guys want to laugh your butts off, go listen to that section of the Sierra Sounds and tell me if that doesn't sound like he's going, "What the fuck?" <laughs> oh my word. That is uh, brilliant, dude. <laughs> well, I was curious, so we asked them, and yeah, that's what was going on. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, don't never forget they're friggin' comedians, and they're very, very smart. They, they like to screw around with us. <laughs> so anyway, I got to get going here. Love you guys, and we'll see you around here next Thursday. Have a great Thanksgiving. Take care of yourselves. I love you all. See you, Super Duke. Thank you for a great report, buddy. Oh, you're welcome, man. It's always fun. We'll see you again soon. Yeah. There goes Super Duke. Now you're stuck with me. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. It's all good, though. What the fuck? That is awesome. My beard's itchy. I can probably get 200,000 views on a short just by combing my beard with my scratching, my bear claw scratcher. Stephanie Jackson, what's going on? Uh, what do I mean by that? Thomas sometimes doesn't have a filter and tonight he was amazing hey there's little robbie g what's happening all right No kidding, ain't eh, Joanne? Grab that party, Nicole. So, um, there's been a lot of, I want to talk seriously here for a quick second. Okay, um, there's been a lot of drama that I'm trying to take care of that's been going on in uh, the chat rooms, and it goes much more beyond than uh, the Deb and Random Guy situation. Okay, um, people getting banned, shadow banned, um, booted for no reason where I have to go and unlock them. And I'm going to be in like, like with the other Vanessa tonight and, and the cheap shots and everything. Um, <clears throat> it's getting really, really hard. Um, and the chat room at times is causing me uh, some unneeded stress as I'm trying to focus on other things on SOR. So what I'm going to be doing here over the next little bit, you, you may agree or not, don't take it as insultingly. If, if you are, it's nothing against you. Um, I got to get the chat room back into order where it's back to a Daveocracy and um, trying to figure out how to do that. Um, I know there's a couple shows out there. We've never done this, 
there's a couple shows out there that and that I've talked to that every few months uh, they blank their their um, their wrenches and and kind of move on from there and <clears throat> re-add them over time. But I think we're blocking too much. I think that we are. Uh, I, I've seen comments uh, during my show, or e- and more so on the weekends, from people who make innocent comments or funny comments that are all of a sudden put in timeout and or bl- or blocked. Um, then I got to go unblock them. <clears throat> so I'm probably for the next little bit here going to be until I get the chat room back to where I want it, which is a fun, safe place to be. Uh, I'm probably going to be uh, getting rid of all the wrenches for the time being. And if you are a wrench, this isn't an insult to you or to anybody else. Okay. It's not that I'm stripping you away and punishing you or anything like that. So I don't need that drama. And so uh, I'm probably going to be doing that until I feel um, until I feel there is a, a modicum of respect back in the chat room. And, uh, and things get back to normal. Okay. I am absolutely, I, I've got a lot of work on my plate for the next, um, for the next little bit here, guys, a lot on my plate and I need to get SOR back to where it was. And the problem that I have, uh, is every time I start to take, and this show starts to take uh, two or three steps forward, uh, we, we are, this drama continues to um take us backwards um a few steps again and i've had people quit the show over it i've had people our audience members leave over it i have had uh people send me notes privately demanding that people get removed or people um, or people uh, um, uh, be kicked out. And it's not just people who you think. I mean, there's a lot of people in our rooms, you know? And so I just, I need a break. I need a break from, from, um, the drama. I need a break to concentrate on the business side of SOR. I need a break to, to, um, make things happen. Um, and honestly, the drama, it kicks the shit out of me. It literally kicks the crap out of me. And, uh, at certain points, I have to say enough is enough. So I've decided that enough is enough that like, even, uh, even the shit last night and going into tonight with that other Vanessa, I'm just, I'm done with it. I'm, I'm absolutely dumb. Dumb. No, I'm not dumb. Uh, I'm done with being, uh, not doing anything and then being brought into the middle of stuff. There are people here that I like. There are people in this chat room I don't like. Right? But nobody is going to dictate to me 
Um, see, Tim, that's a comment that fires me up. Okay. Now I got to remove that comment. See, that's the type of comment on why I'm doing what I'm doing. Okay. I don't care whose fault it is or what it is anymore. Okay. I've been put in the middle of too many situations that are not my fault that I get blamed for. And it causes stress on me. It causes stress on my team. And I'm just, it doesn't matter what the situation is anymore. I'm done. I'm done. And my job, I want to bring you guys and my beautiful supporters that you are the best radio that I can. Okay. And you guys, um, you guys are amazing. Okay. All of you are amazing, but there's a big side of SOR that you don't know. Okay. And that's the business side of everything. I had a well-respected friend of mine. Uh, I'm not going to mention his name. Uh, give me crap a few weeks ago as we were talking business about um, everything that is going right and everything that is going wrong behind the scenes. And, and the big stuff is, is I'm not doing my job behind the scenes that I need to do to be able to take this to that next level. And, and I need to be able to, to do that because eventually something is going to give. Okay. Something is going to give our audience really isn't our, our subscribers are up, but our audience and our, and our viewership time, especially on YouTube is, is not growing. I see the stats. Okay. I know we have to do more in order to create more. I'm trying to find the time to do that between my daytime job, doing this five nights a week, working one night a week to get the shows ready and prepped for the coming week between my son's hockey. Oh, I, I've got a family in there. Um, and at some point that sacrifice has to pay off. Okay. I'm not. And, and what I want, I'm, the reason why I'm telling you all this is because, and I had this conversation with Nicole earlier. Okay. We're not a podcast. Okay. Per se. We are a business. We are a radio show. And there's a few things that have hit me lately that just are not going right behind the scenes. Um, <clears throat> give an example. This invite only to the Soul Conference this past weekend in San Francisco. <clears throat> we weren't invited. Okay. We're one of the bigger shows out there, and we weren't invited. And yet I see other people who are podcasters with a tenth of the subscribers we have i see no radio stations no real media format outside of being a yappy box on twitter and they're invited okay i see um i see a give you an example um we're the only show like this that plays in Vernal, Utah. You, Vernal, Utah is an important market to us because it's right next door to Skinwalker Ranch. So why is that important? Well, every year 
they have an event called Phenomicon. Guess who's not invited to Phenomicon? We have never been invited. But then again, we've only been broadcasting in that in that vicinity for nine months, ten months. So I'm not too worried about that one. We've never been invited to contact in the desert. Uh, we've never been invited to other bigger events. And if you want to grow, you have to be invited to those events. And we have to push harder to get to those events, whether we're speaking or we're just there to make a presence known. Okay. And that is hard for me because, A, I have to take time off work. Uh, B, I need to take time off of what's going on. I need to take time off the show. And with everything that is pressing behind the scenes, you know, we, we need to gain advertisement. Okay, we need to tighten up the show a little bit more. We need to get some video commercials out so you're not staring at a blank chair for four or five minutes while I take a quick break at the top of the hour. And I'm sorry for the blurriness. I'm just uploading to our radio stations right now. Okay, so I can't do everything and I rely on the team to really help me out with that. And um, it's, you know, it's tough to find a minute of the day to try and do things. So I'm just asking everybody to, you know, share with a friend, bring them on in. I mean, I see programs with less less subscribership than ours, and I and I and I you look. I realize that being on at midnight Eastern is tough on a lot of people. Being live at eleven p.m. Central is tough on a lot of people. I get that. I appreciate that. But if you have people who are interested in these topics, and I know a bunch of you, we're not the only show you listen to. Try and bring them our way. Okay, I think at this point, nine on on November 30th, it'll be nine years I've been doing this show. <clears throat> We've never been bigger. We've been smaller. But it would be great if um uh if we could uh um if we could move uh, move uh uh to more audience members. Uh, Decipher, you make a great point. Okay. Uh, youth today want fast and hard facts and interview, not someone telling a story for 15 minutes. I, and this is okay. And that is a great point. <clears throat> and that is something we have discussed behind the scenes. Okay. The, lo the long format show, what I do and what Rob does. Okay, they are, they're the backbone of what we do. It's not the backbone of youth. It's the backbone of the 35 to 65-year-old crowd that actually has money. Okay, so when we bring on advertisements, the, the problem with youth today, they're the ones driving the numbers on social media, but the problem is, um, they're not driving the advertisers, okay? Unless it's something like Prime or something Mr. Beast does or or some of these multi-million subscriber channels are doing. Now, if you look, if you take a look and and you um, and you look at, say, Okay, whether you love him or hate him, Logan Paul with his prime energy drink, like it's like Gatorade or Powerade. 
Okay. What he's done is he's actually teamed up with a bunch of different influencers to try and, and get them on board because they all kind of grew up together in this, in this new world that we call the YouTube world. Okay. And they're helping and collaborating to help each other out. Okay. So for instance, if you watch Mr. Beast videos over the last couple of weeks, now all of a sudden they're advertising Prime as a beverage. Why? Because Mr. Beast and Logan Paul know each other. They're all both in their early, their mid twenties. They're successful millionaires. Okay, and we know that we have to change our programming a little bit in order to get that younger that younger uh, audience. Okay. We know that we have to do that, but guess what? That takes time. So with our, us being an information station and us not having um, a YouTube editor, I don't know how to pull out a short. I don't know how to, uh, to, if I were to, let's say, take tonight's show, go through it and pull clips from it, I would have to wait for the show to finish rendering on YouTube because we're still live. I would then, because it's a three hour show that could take the rendering and, and downloading could take anywhere from one to four hours. And then I have to pull the clips. Right. So, um, that is something. Um, what's going on in the chat room here? Yeah, I've watched every one of his videos too. <clears throat> oh, Michael C., I, I know the feeling. Like my son, you know, it's about video games, right? And so what we're trying to do... Um, it's not about joining the buzzards or that, 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 uh, uh, I, and I hate the term grifting. Okay. Because I think there's a huge difference between being a business. Um, um, there's a difference between being a, a business and actually grifting. Okay, and I think the term grifting actually gets way overused um, in in this field. It really does. And so I'm looking at everything, guys, at, from a business standpoint. What do I have to do in order to have one job? Okay, so in my mind... I need about 25 to 50 radio stations and I need to start putting advertising in the YouTube side is not going to like that because, um, the YouTube side, uh, side is not going to like that. Because they want now, now, I, and I hear it right now, people all at least a couple, three times a week. I hear it from, from, uh, you know, those, those sub listeners who are like, why do you take commercials? You're just wasting time by doing that. You know, well, they don't understand. Like we're trying to put out to three different formats at the same time. Okay. So 
so the the point that I'm getting at is in order for us to to pull the shorts or or do whatever, um, you know, we have to find a way to be successful. And I don't have the time to find it. That's why I have a great team around me. Um, and, you know, if I look at, if I look at our team, which is, you know, Kira, Kat, Justin, Filth, Sweet Robbie G, Eric Markham, Jessica Jones, Nicole, uh, as an advisor, Science Bob. Okay. Uh, who am I missing here? Hold on. I hate missing people and it drives me freaking batty. Uh, am I, who am I missing here? Hold on. Um, okay. Bob said, yes, said, said, oh, I got them all. I got them all. Okay. So I have, uh, a great team around me that is allowing me to, to, or allowing us to grow. We have to tighten up on that back end, but we also have to realize that we have to continually grow. We have to continually push forward with what we are doing. Right. And the game, uh, the shitty part about it is, the the minute you you think you got a grasp on the game uh it's it changes again and then you're left with what the hell do we do now uh yeah and you know what we've never bought a sub we've never bought a sub you know we have to uh um, and I'm open. Trust me. When I see ideas out there, I'm quite open to it. I'm very open to it, but it's got to make sense for what we are doing. Right. And it's got to be feasible because I think we're a million dollar show. I really do. Um, <clears throat> but I also don't think, or even though I think we're a million dollar show, we're running it on a hundred dollar budget and that needs to change. You haven't been around long enough, Nicole, for a, for a nickname. You know, that's why, you know, like when Duke approached me about the collaboration, about taking the cryptid reports over to to his channel. Damn right. That's a good idea. That's a damn good idea. Right? And, and Simon, I understand Discord. I understand that, okay. But I'll tell you, man. I, how do you put this without sounding like a, like an old surly get off my lawn type of prick. Um, I have downloaded discord a couple of times on my phone and the goddamn app never turns off. Okay. You could never exit a room properly. Okay. Even though you're following the patterns, you, you continually get cut off. Uh, GF, 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 G. How you doing, buddy? Um, yeah, we know we need that. We're not going on TikTok, okay? I hate TikTok, uh, and sp and we're already on sp Spotify, and uh, you can't spend money that you don't have. Okay, my money goes to my mortgage. My money from SOR goes to pay my SOR bills. Okay. Uh, I'm still paying off Las Vegas. So, I mean, once again, I already know these ideas. We need to put shorts out there. 
We need to put other type of programming out there. We need lot when there's like a breaking news story, we need to, you know, and Rob and I have talked about this. We need to be on the air when that happens. Okay. The only way for this show to be 1 million percent successful is for me to leave my daytime job and work the phones every day like a proper journalist. That's why you're seeing somebody like Matt Ford and the Good Trouble Show take off. That's why you're seeing other shows like Christina Gomez take off. Okay? Because they're doing the hard work. Okay? My problem is I have a family. I have a mortgage. I have car payments. have to put food on the table. Okay? We do have clickbait headlines. 100% we have clickbait headlines. It's one of the first things I've learned. Right? I use a program before each show to, to go through everything. Dave has tried uh, Discord. And once again, it never shuts off. It never shuts down. Uh, I've had to, in order to get out of a chat room, I've had to turn my phone off just to get out of a chat room. Um, I think a lot of people who I've seen on Discord are ignorant. Um, other people who've had shows like ours have had a lot of trouble on their Discord channels with, with racism, homophobia, um, lots of bullying and everything. That's why I have zero tolerance for Discord. Oh, I, hey, I, I, GF, 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 G. I understand with what you're saying, buddy. There is nothing more that I want than to do this show full time. Okay. I would quit my daytime job tomorrow. I work with my best friend or one of my best friends. I work for him and he relies heavily on me. Uh, I would quit tomorrow if I was making the same money on SOR, like I make in my daytime job, quit tomorrow. 100%. I'm good at working the phones. Okay. I had a, a favor come up earlier tonight before the show for some answers for something. And I, um, had it within 10 minutes. It was a phone call away. That's what I'm good at. Good at that networking stuff. I'm good at all that kind of stuff that needs to be done. Problem is you don't have time. Vinny Adams and I were talking about that pre-show last night. Dave Gibbs, great phone. That's right. So we're trying really hard here over the next little bit to make things work, make things happen. I think we're getting closer. I like the direction the team is going, but we also need your help. The help that we need is keep doing what you're doing. You know, tell your friends about us. Show up in Reno, okay? Like I can tell you right now, Reno will cost me out of my pocket about $3,000 American. And I will enjoy spending every penny of that to make sure that you guys all have a good time. Okay. I will spend that money anytime to make sure you guys have a great time, that you have great stuff in the swag bags, like the posters and the keychains and the t-shirts and the beard oil and the stickers and and everything that went along with it last year. It was fantastic. It was absolutely fantastic. Right? And, you know, we get the guests that we get on this show that come to these events the last two years. 
because they do want to hang out for you with you guys. They do want to hang out with you guys. They want to be a part of it. They want to meet you, the great SOR listeners. I mean, preacher, preacher, you can type in the chat room right now. You you were there last year. What was it like partying with with our our fans and our special guests? You know what that's like. And, and not just going out and having a few beers, but like going for lunch with people or 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 taking in a sky watch. You know, you look beside you and there's Science Bob or or Jim Goodall standing right beside you in a sky watch. Right? That's why we do it. Tim Mothman, you were there. Ozzy Ange, you do, you weren't there for long, but I mean, you had a good time hanging out with us, you and Hubby. We do that for you guys. But it doesn't work if you guys don't come. What are swap casts? What are swap casts? Never heard of that. Swap casts. What is a swap cast? What is a swap cast? <clears throat> a podcast episode that is jointly released by two or more podcast productions. Oh, could try that. See, I'm open to ideas like that. Oh, you're swamp ass sovereign farts. Fart hard, buddy. Fart hard. You know what? Uh, Double Day bringing in the bigger guests, whether it's Lou Elizondo, whether it's uh, Greg and Dana Newkirk, who don't do many interviews whatsoever. Um, it doesn't really help with with the uh, subscribership. It helps with the viewers and the viewing, but doesn't really help with subscribership. What flavor is that? Oh, it's winter blend. Yeah. Dirty filth providing a piece of art for every. Uh, <clears throat> For every swag bag. So, anyways, um, I got to get up for work in the morning. Um, thank you for letting me be a little bit honest with you guys. Okay, uh, I try and, you know, keep it real with you guys because you guys need to know what's going on and you need to uh, be able to understand what's going on in my noggin as well. And <clears throat> And I appreciate each and every one of you for being here each and every night. So if you have any good ideas outside of the ones that we already know, like like shorts and, and other types of programming that are going to catch the eyes, please pass them to me, Dave at SpacedOutRadio.com. Dave at SpacedOutRadio.com. Okay? Pass me. I, I want to... Um, Nikki, the... Uh, hold on. What about the psychics who show up? Free fun. Well, that's all right, man. Um, yeah. 
you can do you can do that if you want, or you can charge ten bucks or whatever. We had people doing that. But anyways, guys, thank you to Pam H, Preacher, Anita, and Steve for the super chats. Hey Neil Warden, how you doing? You're a little late. Who's on tomorrow night? Uh Simon Kennedy, or pardon me, Kenny. Simon Kenny examination examining the nature and belief of tarot oh that's going to be interesting we got some good guests coming up uh cheryl costa is coming up this week next week michael schratt lorian fenton december let's see who we have coming in in december uh Michael W. Hall, Earl Gray, Kevin Day, Jeff Belanger, Paul Hynek, Michael Masters. That's just so far. I haven't even got down and dirty yet. So I'm going to call it the night. We'll see you all tomorrow. Um, love you. See you then. Healthy, my friend. You too. You need bail money. Give me a call. Always, Dad. Take care. <laughs> you too.